Myri was in a corner of the hallway listening to Haimi and Junha talking. She heard that he was being controlled so he did that. Whether he was being controlled or not, he was the type of person who would think it was his own doing. Please use your brain before opening your mouth. Hearing these words, Myri turned away. After walking a bit, he met Garam, who was leaning against the wall. Garam asked Myri, what's wrong? Myri stammered, Garam thought he wanted to go to the inter-treasure meeting room. The meeting room? The exit wasn't this way, it was the other way. See, it's over there. But Myri said no, he bowed his head and said, I heard it. Keep it up, this encouragement took Garam a little by surprise. She smiled and said to Myri, I didn't think I would ever be comforted by you. Did you come to the hospital just to say this? Garam told Myri about his father's condition. He said it was okay. Luckily, the wound wasn't fatal and would heal with gradual treatment, so he didn't need to worry so much. Thanks for worrying about me, I'm fine now. Go to the meeting. Garam gave Myri a gentle smile. Looking at Myri walking away made Garam think, I've always misunderstood this kid, Myri is a better person than I thought. But why didn't the commander let me attend this meeting? I can't go see the commander because I have to be with my dad. I'll come say hello after the meeting ends. In the conference room, Nuri was on crutches due to her injured leg but still managed to conduct the meeting smoothly. She started speaking, okay to summarize. In each camp, they arranged dolls and cadres, but for some unknown reason, all the bodies caught fire, and the invitations that appeared in the bodies of these cadres did not burn. The place this invitation points to is most likely Spetter's hideout. No matter how dangerous it is, in order to catch Spetter we have no choice but to go to the place this invitation points to. Also, Nuri looked at Gear who was standing in a corner and said, that ability, are you an exorcist or something? Aren't you Spetter's puppet? Year said again, a goblin. Actually, I don't understand my own ability, it's just that when I opened my eyes and regained consciousness, I already look like that. Nuri still couldn't trust her so he said, honestly, this is a character who has connections with Spetter after all. I think we can accept some of this information since the other side has agreed to help us. Year continued to stammer, the reason being guilt. Whatever the reason, I have killed many people with my own hands. Even if I stand up to help people now, I don't think my sins will be cleared, at least I want to atone for my mistakes. Even though I can't be a member of the group, I can't abandon my mission and my friends. She looked at Nuri questioningly, but I didn't know she would accept me so easily, I thought she would hesitate. Nuri sighed and said, this isn't the first time I've done this. Nuri suddenly remembered something, she angrily said, no, come to think of it, I called him but that idiot still didn't come, until yesterday he was still acting like a normal person. She rubbed her forehead and said, okay, there's still something to discuss right now. Let's talk about it later, just like what Nuri said earlier, your year didn't understand who she was talking about and could only stand there and listen dumbly. Nuri continued speaking foolishly, even if the meeting ended, she should not leave here, she herself knew clearly that many people would resent her and turn around to kill her. Do you understand? Now step forward. It was Garam, she stood there listening to Nuri and your year talking, Garam's eyes darkened. Nuri discovered something. Before she could react, Garam had already rushed to attack your year. Nuri only had time to shout, Garam, wait. Suddenly Myri appeared from somewhere and blocked Garam's attack. He asked Garam, what are you doing? Garam was now angry and said impatiently, I was the one who said that, what the hell are you doing? On Myri frowned and asked uncomfortably, what are you doing? Garam rolled his eyes and said, I'm the one who said that, what the hell are you doing? Don't you know who she is? She asked, standing opposite him. I know, isn't it your year? On Myri replied, if you know that, why are you stopping me? Garam said, she is the one who killed Kim Min-sung, this statement surprised you, huh? Garam shouted angrily, she was the one who killed the people we tried to save, she was also the one who proudly declared war on us over the radio. Are you protecting her now? On Myri turned her head to look at your ear who was still calmly stuffing her hands in her pockets, not saying anything. On Myri turned to Garam and hesitantly said, I don't know. Your ear stepped forward, she patted on Myri on the shoulder and said, it's okay, I'll talk to her directly. First of all I want to apologize, your ear had not finished her sentence when Garam swung his arm to attack her. Garam, everyone shouted and pushed unexpectedly. Sorry, you know how to behave, sorry, but what about Min Sun's death, it doesn't disappear, Garam said angrily. Your year was grabbed by Garam's shirt with one hand, she didn't resist but spoke with difficulty. Huh, even if I had ten mouths I wouldn't know what to say, if you vent your anger on me to help you release it, you can hit me as much as you want. Hit you, do you think I just want to vent my anger on you, Garam shouted angrily, she hit him again? Memories of that day seemed to flood back, Garam smiled and looked back, everyone was smiling and waving goodbye to them, don't worry, definitely, we will come back. Garam's eyes widened, there was only anger in her eyes. She had no idea how much those dead people meant to me. Suddenly someone spoke up too loudly, enough, Jean Garam, why do you always act like a child? Yeon Niri frowned and said, thanks to your year, the western camp did not have any injuries, and thanks to her, the medical team that went on a business trip to the west could return safely. My father is being treated now, thanks to your year's efforts, Yeon Niri said. Jun could only open her mouth in shock, wanting to say something again. Yeon Niri sighed, I understand how you feel right now, but please act rationally, she will be a great help to our team in the future. At this point, rushing in and fighting would not do any good. 
Garam fell silent upon hearing this, veins still bulging on her small face. I see, Garam said, loosening his grip on your ear's collar to her surprise. So, I just need to vent my anger, Garam suddenly kicked your ear out, the wall broke apart to everyone's surprise. Jean, Jean Garam, Chion Niri shouted loudly, Garam like a monster full of anger rushed straight towards your ear who had just been blown away. Jin looked outside through the large hole in the wall and floor, stunned, above, there was no book on her, how could she use her ability? Chion Nuri also leaned over to take a look, she had a summary in her bag, just the summary of the book was enough. It's really unbearable, she said. Anmairi silently observed everything. Garam landed gently on the already broken road, she asked, why didn't you avoid it? That kind of blow is enough for you to avoid, Garam said, standing up straight, or do you think it's not worth avoiding this group? Yuri -Yur pushed herself up. Yes, it's not worth avoiding it, she replied with a bow. This word continued to anger Garam. She rushed straight towards Yuri -Yur who was standing with her head bowed in front and said, indeed it was so. Things like that shallow apology were not suitable for someone like her. Self-righteous and arrogant, Garam said as he launched a powerful attack on Yuri. -Yur. Seeing humans as nothing more than insects, with such an attitude, she took a step forward. Isn't that her true appearance? Garam swung his leg and kicked Yuri, -Yur, sending her flying. She quickly used one hand to grab Yuri's -Yur collar. How about it? Another punch, Garam shouted, still not worth avoiding. Yeah. Continue to take the blows, it's better to keep face than to lose. That's right, Yuri -Yur still didn't counterattack but took each blow from Garam. Say something, Garam shouted, hitting Yuri's -Yur cheek causing her nose to bleed. Without saying anything, Garam suddenly stopped. Yuri -Yur knelt before Garam, I had to take all these attacks. She bowed her head and said, you can do whatever you want to me. If you can make up for the mistakes I made, even just a little bit, that's fine. Garam gritted his teeth and did not answer. Suddenly she shouted loudly, using her ability to aim straight at your ear who was sitting collapsed on the spot. This is not what I want, get up now, get up and fight. Enough, Anmairi suddenly appeared a few steps behind Garam, let's stop here. Garam shouted angrily, why do you keep protecting her? What the hell is she, is she worth you protecting her? Why all this time? That's not it, Anmairi said calmly. This is complete nonsense, his words made Garam pause. Garam is a good man. If you do favors for others to fill your self-esteem, complete tasks to feel valuable, then you are a selfish benefactor. So I know very well why he went crazy because of the death of Kim Min Sung, a person who had nothing to do with him. Death is usually an expression of sadness. But through revenge to raise one's self-esteem, it is an expression of anger. On Myri looked at Garam's unmoving back. Furthermore, with his actions right now, Garam cancelled his ability. It was completely pointless, just a rash act. Garam raised a hand to cover his face, thinking back on his actions. Please, Yuri -Yur suddenly spoke up, covered in injuries. Even if I die, I will help everyone capture Spetter. So, she slowly said each sentence. Xion Nuri and June also arrived. Please, let me help everyone, Yuri -Yur said. Garam remained standing there, silent. I heard about the invitation, let me join the battle plan with everyone, Garam suddenly said to Xion Nuri. I won't let any more damage happen, she said. Xion Nuri let out a breath. Okay, I get it. Garam passed by Yuri. -Yur. She called, Yuri. -Yur. You have to give it your all. Garam looked straight ahead, not turning his head. Your year was silent for a moment and then replied, Um. So under Garam's leadership, a vanguard team was formed to investigate the origin of the invitation. The vanguard set out immediately. Investigate Spetter's base. In a strange space, objects fly freely everywhere. Someone said, What are you doing? The table covered the man's face. An invitation, why are you doing such meaningless things? I didn't send you here to play. He said to a person sitting on the ground. Spetter turned back and said, since when have you been here? Do you have a hobby of peeping? The other person stepped forward, his shiny leather shoes and trousers appearing. Don't even think about avoiding me, I've had enough of your nonsense all this time. Terate's face revealed, he said, go kill those humans for me now, or do you want to be killed by me? Terate angrily gritted his teeth, go kill those humans for me now, or do you want to be killed by me? Spetter sat with his back to Terate and calmly replied, if that was a promise then I would have kept it. Weren't you the one who created the reason for the humans to attack? From now on I will do as I please. Spetter stood up, turned to Tarate, and said with a smirk, Hey, was it Tarate who told you to watch me? Can you stop now? No fun at all. Spetter had barely finished speaking when a black aura enveloped Tarate. Immediately after that, Tarate disappeared and was replaced by Herang. After transforming, Herang smiled and said casually, Is it that obvious? I thought I was doing a good job. Herang slowly walked towards Spetter and said, How wonderful is it to meet you in person for the first time? I heard you like to joke around, it seems you're more difficult than I thought. Officially introduced to people as Herang, Herang is the third Arhat of Tarate. Herang continued, why don't you stop your nonsense and go kill humans? It's not fun. Spetter was playing with the ropes and heard Herang say that and said back, what do you know, wild tiger cubs are a more pitiful existence than we think. Without its mother tiger, it can't do anything, 
but if you attack it, it will bite you to death, always like that. Don't be so arrogant and go away. If you want Turek to love you, go wag your tail at him. Harang laughed at what Spetter just said. He performed moves that caused the surroundings around Spetter to explode. Harang said, he is a cadre after all, you shouldn't speak so carelessly. Any high-level mutant zombie should know this, right? Except for Turret, the remaining cadres are only tasked with maintaining this society. Just sit on your crumbling throne and laugh all you want, because I will deal with the humans myself. Spetter didn't say anything for a while but that didn't mean she agreed. After Harang walked a few steps, Spetter said, What a pity, why did you come here to show off your madness like that? Not receiving a mask makes you so sad, these words made Harang's walking feet stop. Harang still half-jokingly said, Be grateful for the mask you have, that's why I didn't kill you. The toothless tiger can just stay there and enjoy his old age, I will do everything myself. Back at the Niri group's headquarters, Garam was puffing at something. Garam recalled what Niri said, Niri held the paper in his hand and explained, Let's check if the invitation reacts to the wind, this will help us in investigating its origin. For example, even if everyone blew right in front of her like this, the invitation would still turn in a different direction, Niri said as she practiced with the invitation in her hand. Garam tried and succeeded, making her quite surprised and unable to hold back, exclaiming, Really, the invitation fell in the other direction, going this way must be right. But after only a few steps, the invitation fell down. Garam wondered, did it fall so quickly or did he blow too lightly? At this moment Yir suddenly appeared behind Garam she said, Hey can I apologize again, I couldn't finish just now. Yir's enthusiasm made Garam somewhat helpless. Yir asked again, really? Are you apologizing again? From Changwon to here, I've probably apologized 5000 times. Okay, stop here. Yir heard that and happily smiled brightly and said, Okay, so now you will forgive me, right? But Garam immediately denied it, it's not like that but anyway stop using me. At this time Myri also appeared, Garam immediately asked, Hey Myri, can't you control the wind? Myri immediately denied that he couldn't do it, but Yir was very excited and said, I can do it. As Yir was good at, wind and fire are closely related, leave it to me, I will lead the way, Yir said as she practiced with the invitation. But the invitation fell before it could fly high, everyone laughed at Yir, the atmosphere became much happier. Yir explained, because now I don't have the mask or the sword, my strength is much weaker, I'm sorry. Hearing that, Garam wondered, what does the mask have to do with having strength or not? Yir explained again, because my mask was given to it by Tarei to increase its power, but it was no good either since the mask acted as a surveillance organ. Yir scratched her head and apologized again. Yir apologized so much that Garam lost his patience. She said, stop apologizing, she couldn't help anyway. The three of them used the primitive method of blowing with their mouths again. Garam said optimistically, if we blow it until midnight, we will definitely see something. Three hours later, the three of them were still diligently blowing on the letter. Already exhausted, Garam said, must be going crazy, like this his mouth was bleeding because it was so dry. Yir also didn't have enough strength to blow anymore, now there was no wind anymore, all he could do was spit out his nose. Immediately after the letters reacted, it changed direction, three letters went in three different directions. Garam held the letter in his hand and read it while instructing everyone, since we can't go too far, we should first learn about it nearby and then meet again to discuss. When the sun sets, we will meet in the nearby forest. So the three of them continued on their own separate ways. Yir was very determined, she puffed up her lips and blew on the letter, determined as she worked, no matter what she had to make up for her mistake, she had to be the first one to find Spetter. Garam here also had difficulty blowing, thinking while doing it, is this the right way to do it, it seems like this way is a bit inconvenient. Myri also walked while blowing on the letter. Myri walked and found the space very quiet. He thought, walking alone is quieter than he thought, it's been a long time since he walked alone so he forgot this feeling. The sky has changed color, night has come. Garam, Myri, and Yir met. Garam asked Myri, we told you over the radio, why are you still late? Did you find anything? We didn't find anything. The three of them sat together, all looking at each other helplessly. Myri suddenly sat close to Garam, making her confused. She asked Myri, what is it? Myri didn't answer right away, but just joked back and forth. The two of them, one kept asking and the other didn't answer, and it went on like that for a while. Yir, who was standing beside him, looked like she had a headache and spoke up. It might be a bit arrogant of me to ask this question, but how are we going to investigate tomorrow? Garam stammered, not knowing how to answer. Garam thought sadly, honestly he couldn't think of any way. If he did a random investigation like today, would he find anything? Unable to think of anything, Garam stood up and said, I'll talk tomorrow, you two rest now, I'll go get some fresh air. Garam went to a quiet place and sat alone in contemplation. Her eyes were sad. Suddenly a hand grabbed Garam's helmet. Before he could finish, Garam shouted angrily. Go away, do you think I will believe you are human? Go away, if you touch me I will kill you all. Kyoho saw Garam so agitated and asked worriedly. Little girl, we won't hurt you, calm down. The person walking next to Kyoho said to Kyoho, Kyoho, use your ability too. Kyoho heard it was reasonable so he agreed and practiced. But he was stopped again. It was raining now, Garam stood in the rain looking into the distance. In the void a voice echoed, in this corrupt era not everyone is good, however not everyone is bad. At least you should be wary of us, if I were you I would also say no to such people. The voice was Lee Kyung's. 
She appeared in front of Garam and sat down, reaching out to Garam and saying, I am Lee Kyung, the captain of the suicide squad, what is your name? Garam looked at Lee Kyung, bewildered, thinking, strangely, as soon as I heard the captain's voice, I felt relieved. I felt extremely secure, as if she would protect me. Garam also quickly took Lee Kyung's hand and told Lee Kyung his name. Lee Kyung took Garam's hat back and put it on her, not forgetting to warn her that if Garam kept sitting like that, she would catch a cold. Lee Kyung said, stand up and come with us. Garam touched his cap, remembering the day he first met Lee Kyung, and asked himself, am I doing well? Can I fill the captain's void? While he was lost in thought, a voice came from behind, hey I want to ask for directions. Garam heard the voice and turned around to ask, who is it? It turned out to be Herring, he still had his face half covered, his eyes narrowed as he asked, is he human? Hey I want to ask for directions, someone suddenly raised his voice causing Garam to panic and turn around shouting, who is that? Seeing her, he smiled, huh, she's human? Good, just in time to ask a human something, Garam stared at Herring and thought to himself. What, is that a mutated zombie? When did he appear? I'm looking for people who carry Spetter's invitation, you know? He kept a gentle smile on his lips. Garam's face darkened, a sense of wariness rising. She wondered if Spetter had sent him? He probably didn't know that she was looking for them. What should she do? Should she fight him? She frowned involuntarily, no it couldn't be. Even without fighting, I knew this guy was not an ordinary mutant zombie. Absolutely cannot fight this guy alone, do not make a move now. Suddenly there was a loud bang, no joke right? He said and attacked Garam, startling her but luckily she was still alert enough to dodge the attack. He still cheerfully told her, don't rack your brain with such a serious expression. Anyone can see that you are the one with the invitation, I really knew before coming here. Herring put away the sword, smiled and continued, but don't worry because I have no intention of killing you, I just came to help. A colorful piece of paper was held up, which he said was useless. Garam continued, the invitation had nothing to do with Spetter, it was just to buy time. Yu Yer asked her so the purpose was related to Spetter's plan in Chanwan? Yes she replied. Yu Yer secretly speculated, if we review the whole day then it is very likely like that, that guy is really suspicious. Why tell us this information, Garam said, slightly dazed, that. Spetter that brave guy, I only saw that thing once, wouldn't it be obvious if I thought a little? Garam asked him doubtfully, just that, of course not, I have my own goals. The person who Spetter killed was too awkward for me, because I wanted to appear on a larger stage. That for you, it will be another chance, he said. Yer Yer heard the story and asked more, he said that and then disappeared, another chance I don't understand what it means. You don't know who that zombie is either. Yer Yer replied, you said he had two swords and was wearing a black mask. Sorry but I don't know the name, it's not a very memorable feature. Yer Yer took the invitation, ignoring that, she asked again, but hey, then let's stop clarifying the origin of the invitation. Garam hesitated a bit then replied, to be honest, I don't completely trust him. I think it's better for us to see for ourselves and not be swayed by this uncertain information. Yer Yer continued, so instead of being uncertain about this information, we should continue with the original plan, doing so will have fewer incidents. Then tomorrow when the sun comes up we will investigate. Garam agreed. Finally the new day begins. They continue to investigate, first consulting the map. Then split into three search paths. As for Harang, he sighed and scolded this bunch of idiots. It's already brought to your mouth but you still won't eat it, what a waste of time. No, no, thinking about it, Spetter knew he had come into contact with humans. Why hasn't he done anything yet, he could only let out a ha. Oh no, who knows, what is this bastard Spetter planning to do? A small hand knocked on the door and asked doctor if he was in. The girl held the tray of food and looked silently. Then she said, please leave the food in front of the door. I hope you get your spirits up, there are many patients waiting for you. A voice said Heyong is here. A stranger says the same thing every time, you've worked hard, the girl replies, can I come in now? Of course, be careful. The little girl held something yellow in her hand, her face showing obvious worry. A scream rang out, the veiny arm swung up causing the little girl to duck her head and avoid it. I have brought what you asked me to bring, is this enough? She reached out and held the yellow thing in front of the guy. He made a few strange awe sounds, then reached out to the iron frame and grabbed it. It was Dongo, he smiled happily and said spicy tuna. Heyong scratched her head and smiled and said to him, this is right, I got it mixed up with the others. Dongo ate hastily, saying thank you Heyong. The girl smiled and said, eat slowly, you will get full. It's amazing, it's been a long time since he ate human flesh. He stopped to chat with the girl while eating, on the contrary, he felt very healthy. She smiled happily in response, look how excited he was. Are you okay living here? It must be tiring. I asked curiously. Dongo knew she was worried so he immediately replied, it's okay, it's okay. It's natural for humans to be afraid of zombies, isn't it? He had been there before so he understood. He let out a sigh, besides, how should he put it, his position wasn't the same as Rishuru's so he was fine anyway. So how is Garam, he asked, the girl said confusedly, oh that. The girl looked intently to one side, causing Dongo to ask, what's wrong? Oh, it seems like someone is here. Rishuru suddenly looked down. 
A hand slammed into the ground. Kim Junha does push-ups with great enthusiasm. Okay, okay, I've taken another thousand. Yeah, let's run around together. He yelled, what? Kim Junha tried to run while screaming. Stronger, I will be stronger. She ran after him and kept scolding him, shut up and run away. As expected, my instructions were ineffective. Chion Niri thought, resting her chin on her hand. I felt so proud when everyone followed my orders. You ran well, I'll be back later. Hearing that, he immediately said goodbye. Have a good trip, commander. Now the first thing we need to do is to be vigilant against imposters. What the imposter can do is to imitate the appearance and habits. She read the report carefully and said again. We must investigate as soon as possible to see if there are any more imposters. A voice came in. The bun had no red beans and was eating her. The voice made her a little surprised. Hot dogs have no sausages, planes have no wings. That was Rishura's voice. Where have you been all this time? Do you know how long I've been looking for you? Rishuru has no master. What do you think these things have in common? He asked a strange question that made her suspicious enough to ask back. What are you talking about? Her eyes widened as if she realized something. Come to think of it, this guy returned to his original form without permission. I'm here to fight the master. He attacked her. Without a master, what do you mean to me now? I'm here to fight the master. He attacked her. Without a master, what reason do you have with me now? She was frightened by that blow. If you find it too difficult to answer, let me say it. Lately I've been thinking a lot about why I'm so close to humans. The answer to this is simpler than I thought. No, maybe my instincts told me this already. The master loves people. So I must also love people like my master. That is the expression of devotion to my master. In the end it was true love. I love you, my little people. He looked so stupid that even Shion Niri secretly despised him. I thought he had woken up, but he was even worse than before. It was too pitiful. Okay, okay, can I ask you something? She asked, he replied, tell me. In another place, someone said, hello guys. I am Rishuro, the preacher of love. I will guide you in your training from now on. Love preacher Kim Haney questions this name. Shion Niri just says, I don't know, that's what he calls himself. Anyway, his combat experience is much better than mine. So he will give everyone some good tips when facing zombies. Even though it's not very pleasant, I hope everyone will follow his instructions well. Two people can do it, Junha replied indifferently. I'm fine with anything as long as I get stronger, Haimi is the opposite, she doesn't like it. Learn from this guy, better die than die. He pressed close to her and asked, Disciple, do you hate me? Get lost, she panicked and swung her arm to hit him. He leaned back slightly to avoid it, but he just said, don't worry. Sooner or later you will feel my feelings. She shouted loudly, she said she didn't like it. Kim Junha saw the scene above and judged, Rishura, this guy's internal energy is no joke. Is it okay, hey man, sorry, this is the best way. Someone said loudly, Commander. Everyone's back, Garam said, we heard you were here so we came to find you. Has anything special happened in Chan Wan lately? Your year looked to one side. Rishuru, why is the guy I thought was dead here? He stuttered. Then suddenly shouted, zombie go die. What kind of place is this for a zombie like you to step into? Go away, before he could finish speaking he received a slap from Myri. The vanguard then shared what happened during their journey. Garam said, a zombie revealed information that we had never heard before. But I ignored this information and continued investigating the invitation as originally planned. You found that bracelet, right? Garam held up the bracelet and glanced at it. She continued, yes Myri and your year have them too. The destination of the invitation leads to a small hole on the top of a certain mountain. There are three rings in it. These three bracelets automatically stick to our hands, and we cannot remove them. We cannot cut them off either. After that, nothing changes in our health or our environment. Who knows, maybe the zombie on the street was right. Using invitations was just a way to stall for time. Chion Nuri said hesitantly, to raid Chan Wan. Garam also replied, yes maybe. Her eyes suddenly fell, not knowing whether she was thinking or realizing something. Chion Nuri stared at the red bracelet lying still in Garam's hand. Okay, if it's fast then it's today, if it's slow then it'll be a month. I predict Spetter's game won't last long either. From now on, the government branch member is absolutely dead. Chion Niri's face became more serious, she spoke loudly, preparing to fight with all her might. In preparation for a war that could break out at any moment, Commander Chion Niri increased military strength. In such a short period of time, all the troops of the Suicide Army, even if it's Kim Junha, Kim Haimi, is Garam, everyone tries, each person makes constant efforts. Wait I said stop it. Over here Zadel, Zadel, hearing Myri call that, Yu Yu said angrily. What? Why do you keep joking? If he believed it, he would definitely die. Jizian took the little girl and walked out. The two of them laughed. Jizian asked, the zombie's name is Zadel, Zadel? Your year here struggled to explain, no, it's your year, everyone knows it so why do you keep joking? 
Simple dishes were laid out on the table. Someone said, let's eat Myri had already prepared them since she was here. Yur Yur looked at the pot of food in the middle of the table and asked Myri suspiciously. What is that thing in the middle, food? He hugged. So that's real food. Jizian looked at her and thought to himself, the Red Army's guardian looked just like a child the same age as Myri. It's just that the stance of zombies and humans are different. But the desires in their hearts are sometimes the same. After all, they were once humans. She happily pushed the pot of curry towards her. Her attitude and tone were welcoming. Come on, don't just stand there and eat. Haven't you had this for a long time? Yu Yu shook her hand and lowered her voice. Oh, that, you. Or do you think my curry is not pretty? I tried very hard to make it. And then she burst into tears. No, it's not like that. Someone said it was delicious, maybe it was to my taste. Myri next to me said so. It had nothing to do with the taste, it was just that it had been a long time since I had felt this kind of atmosphere. Phew, she sighed. I know. Okay. I'll try a bite. She picked up her spoon and tried to scoop up a mouthful of curry. Have you thought about homegrown bamboo? Year. Wait a minute, son. Is this right? Daddy did a good job, right? No, can't daddy fry an egg? Why did daddy separate the egg white and yolk? Oh no, I said I would do a good job. Yur Yur burst into tears. Tears rolled down her cheeks. What's wrong? Did we do something wrong? Auntie Jizian asked her in panic. What should we do? The curry must be really bad. So bad that we're crying? A sly smile rang out. It's time for you guys to get back to normal life. Excuse me. Yur Yur jumped up. The commander is not well. The radio is making a sound. She asked. What's going on? Right now outside the main gate of the city wall there are many spetter dolls coming towards us. Chiyo Nuri calmly thought to herself. Is it here, spetter? Right now, outside the main gate of the city wall, there are many spetter dolls coming towards us. A girl was resting her chin on the back of her hand in a somewhat dark and thoughtful scene. Are we here yet, spetter? Dozens of walkie-talkies on the table. Chiyo Nuri shouted loudly, announcing to everyone. After this moment, we will enter a period of war. Everyone prepare for the assault. The black clothed warriors' faces were filled with determination at Nuri's words. All the troops on the outer line moved in the direction they had been trained. The sound of thousands of soldiers running echoed in her voice. The captains were right in the area, not letting the enemy enter, concentrating their forces according to strategy. A black clothed soldier with blonde hair and freckled cheeks was sweating profusely as he reported the situation after the question. How is the situation ahead? He answered hesitantly. Ahead. He continued. There was no movement. Chiyo Nuri said suddenly. What? She commented on the red dolls stopping in place that the spetters were all standing in place. Chiyo Nuri continued. They were laughing. The red creatures were laughing a savage laugh. A pair of legs in blue pants and leather shoes with sharp, serrated stalls were stepping down on crystal cubes. The person said. I heard something. From where? So you guys were all prepared. Spetter sat on the crystal slab. Her hands were wrapped in red threads and her mouth was twisted into a ghastly smile as she spoke. But what to do? I wasn't trying to aim that way. The face of a black-haired soldier suddenly exploded and turned red like a spetter, much to the shock of the silver-haired soldier. As the soldiers were running, one of their faces exploded and turned into a spetter. Spetter's eyes narrowed as she said, the outer glands are important too but you should pay attention to the inner glands. A soldier asked Chiyo Neri, the commander, over the radio, that they were everywhere in the inner lines. She was stunned by the current situation, when the soldiers continued to report, they discovered members turned into dolls. The walkie-talkies continued to ring with reports from the soldiers, the commander now in the square, the commander at the crossroads, commander, commander, commander. A piece of paper covered with shaky handwriting and the number 82 written in large font circled in red pen appeared. Spetter's yellow eyes seemed to realize something. On the other side, Chiyo Nuri's eyes slightly sank, remaining calm. All, just as I expected. The fakes can only imitate appearance and habits. They can't imitate logical movements, Chiyo Nuri crossed her arms and leaned back in her chair, thinking. Using it to identify the fakes wasn't difficult. I've memorized the radius of activity of everyone living in the murderous government. The cards came up, with a hand of spades facing up and thinking, they like to play. If that was the case, the image of Chiyo Nuri holding a card in her hand appeared, opposite Spetter who was turning his back holding the cards. Chiyo Nuri continued her train of thought, which was exactly what she wanted. The bald black-clothed soldier placed the police-printed shield in front of him, causing a human to be transformed into Spetter to be crushed. Uncle Jussie picked up the radio and said, Commander, I've checked all the private plans you requested. Chiyo Nuri stood up and leaned on the table, under her hands were thick documents and surrounded by dozens of walkie-talkies. She thought, to complete the Chiyo Nuri battle plan, a hypothesis needed to be tested, there were two hypotheses. She continued her train of thought, first, the Spetter dolls prioritized pursuing marked targets. Chiyo Nuri held her crutch in one hand and the doorknob in the other while thinking. They used the invitation to determine who was strong on our side. 
Because normally when investigating something, we always send out capable people. A white-hatted boy with a red string wrapped around his wrist appeared in Chion Niri's thoughts, so those bracelets were used to eliminate them. That bracelet was considered a mark for elimination. She continued to think of the next hypothesis, the second, that those dolls only attack predetermined targets. Chion Niri limped down the hallway with his crutch and walkie-talkie, thinking to himself, maybe not, it would follow the target. An attack at a certain range and angle. If so, just be careful of their attack range. The image of soldiers running with spetter dolls behind them appeared in Chion Niri's mind. The marked members lured the dolls and the unmarked members finished them off. With his eyes deep in thought, Chion Niri thought, this way, our side will minimize the damage, we can withstand their raid. Thousands of red dolls swarmed towards the wall, making her think, the dolls outside the wall right now, just deal with them with super convergence. Chion Niri continued her train of thought, Spetter, you are so arrogant, your time has come, while speaking into the walkie-talkie. June, get ready, I'm coming now. Spetter sat on a square stone slab amidst the vast sky, crossed his legs and counted lightly, 79.8, 0.8, 1.82, .8, no, it really was no. She smiled wickedly, you guys prepared so carefully, thank you, the dolls I prepared, up to 83 of them. Suddenly, there were two Chion Niris standing in the middle of the dark ruins facing each other. It must have been the real Chion Niris who was holding the walkie-talkie, because she was frozen in shock. Before she could figure out what had happened, the fake Chion Niri rushed over, causing blood to ooze from her mouth. In panic, her pupils narrowed as she thought, why, clearly Rishuru had said she needed new hair. A bloody scene from the past appeared in her mind, she silently guessed, could it be that time? The scene was when she was kneeling down, clutching her bleeding stomach, screaming in pain in front of a man's thick nose. And her walkie-talkie had fallen, she thought, predicted, analyzed, strategized Chion Niri, everything was perfect, except for one thing. Chion Niri collapsed, her whole body lying face down in a pool of her own blood with her crutch beside her, thinking to herself, everything was perfect. Along with the incident that Chion Niri encountered, the other side of the radio was extremely impatient, the commander gave the next order, before he could finish his sentence, a large man bumped into the soldier. The soldier asked, what's the matter? Didn't you go the other way? At the same time, a red hand reached out. The big soldier replied, no, I didn't receive any orders, I just responded there. The red hand immediately rushed forward, grabbed the skinny soldier's head, making him scream, and pulled it away from me. The soldier retreated, only able to scream, this, me, everything was in chaos, someone shouted, behind him. The soldiers struggled to fight the dolls that had rushed forward, but behind them, a whole group of those dolls continued to rush forward with piercing screams, Commander. Garam panicked and said through the walkie-talkie while observing the situation around, Commander, the direction of each team is now off course, she shouted, Commander. Before her eyes was the image of a doll rushing towards the soldier, she realized in horror, damn, what happened all of a sudden, everyone listen clearly, I think something happened to the commander. She ran to hit the doll hard, continuing to say, for now, our priority is saving people. Kim Junha was running over with Kim Haney at this time. Hearing the order, his face turned sinister and he said enthusiastically, good, it's been a long time since I punched a few guys, this guy is sick of it. The pink-haired female warrior your year also immediately rushed over, replying to the person on the walkie-talkie, I'll do it right away, saving people is enough, right? Spetter said, his index finger raised and playing with the threads arranged into neat squares suspended in the air, you guys can't save them. Like a huge explosion, everything around Spetter now appeared with dazzling rays of light, and Spetter sat on the crystal square stone like a leader of that red thread. The red thread seemed to be guided and flew straight down to the scene where smoke was exploding on the ground. What she created was an extremely large Spetter doll, with tear-filled eyes, standing tall before Kim Haimi and Kim Junha. Doll's jet black hair fell away, and your ear looked like a tiny creature before it. Even Garam was shocked by the height of the red doll with black hair standing before him. She exclaimed, what is this thing? There was a loud noise, the doll's fist fell on where Garam was standing, causing her to immediately fly away. Garam warned everyone over the radio that a very strange guy appeared on our side, everyone should do their duty to save people. Kim Junha saw the bald red doll coming and screamed, it's the same here, we can't go. Yir Yir, who was using fire magic from her hand against the long-haired red demon, also received information from Garam. What about Yir Yir? She struggled to answer, same here, I don't think I can easily defeat this guy. Garam's eyes widened in horror and fear, she broke out in a cold sweat and silently calculated in her head, this was bad, if this continued it would cause heavy damage. Spetter smiled sinisterly, with the corners of his mouth stitched with red thread and his teeth slightly discolored. She laughed loudly and said, how boring, her hand picked up a card from someone's hand that was holding three cards, and continued, you guys are so confident. Han struggled to reach out to touch the walkie-talkie that fell on the ground, along with a difficult gasp. Chion Niri gasped for breath with her mouth full of blood, her hand clutching the walkie-talkie. She thought to herself, there's no other way, we have to somehow end this and minimize the damage on our side. Spetter's eyes with yellow pupils darkened, she must have realized something. The hand wrapped in red thread is holding a blue card in its fist. Causing the card to fold into an arc she blurted out, ha, huh, and thought to herself, thanks to you, it turns out to be a joker card. Onmyri's figure appeared with her purple eyes flashing as she walked towards her, Onmyri. Chion Niri sat opposite Onmyri with a calm face and then she spoke, this time he would not be included in the battle plan, not to say exactly. On Myri's expressionless face always looked like it had no vitality left. She wondered, why, what if everyone died? 
Chiyong Niri sighed helplessly and replied, Worrying about others is not like you at all, you have changed a lot. I just want to ask you one question. Do you think our members are weak? Chiyong Niri's words made Myri look at her involuntarily. Then he replied, No. Hearing on Myri's words, she smiled with satisfaction and said, Alright then, just follow my orders because everything has been calculated. At the most crucial moment, along with that on Myri shot straight up from the ground into the sky. When he flew up, he attracted the attention of his two teammates. They looked at him and asked each other, What is it? Is that Myri? Where is Myri? That teammate wondered, Where did he go without helping us? Did he abandon us? As soon as he finished speaking, a bloody hand reached up and grabbed the ground. Suddenly a voice rang out, All members paid attention. Chion Nuri shouted, Myri won't support us. She spoke on the phone with Jussie and the other teammates. He will go straight to Spetter to arrest her. This is my order. Everyone heard this and said loudly in dissatisfaction, Damn it, what about us? Are normal people like us just going to die like this? Save us too. Chion Nuri calmly continued, Everyone trusts Myri right. She continued, Without Myri's help, nothing can be done, do people really think so? Myri's battle will be taken care of by Myri and we just need to continue our battle. Kim Junha and Kim Haimi also calmly listened to what she said clearly. Chion Nuri said with all her might, the winner today is not Myri. But the army that kills us. Her words struck a chord with her teammates. Everyone heard as if their willpower had been given more strength, everyone gritted their teeth. Then shouted and ran forward with fearless determination, everyone shouted, let's charge and fight. Attack, from now on we will fight individually, no matter what the cost we must try to win. While saying that everyone charged towards the zombies. Chion Niri closed her eyes and said to herself, yes, it must be so. Myri, you are not our weapon, you just need to be our hope. Chion Niri's final battle plan. All teammates fought hard against the zombies and did not give up. Chion Niri lay down with wounds all over her body but she still smiled and spoke triumphantly. What to do Spetter, you think you won and are so complacent. Don't laugh too quickly because my death is not a failure. Now, let's start the second half. Myri is flying at full speed towards Spetter. She was now smiling arrogantly. Kim Junha spoke up to Garam. Hey Jean Garam, did you hear that just now? It seems like everyone has regained their composure. Then let's give them a good fight. Garam replied, Ha, huh, the commander said so, let's fight with all our might. Kim Junha heard that and smiled slyly and replied, Okay, we can fight now. Then he held the baseball with murderous eyes and said, Hey you, get ready. He threw the ball with force and said, Super speed ball. Six cylinder throw, the ball flies very fast. The zombie dodged to the side. Kim Haney jumped up and hit the ball and said, it's useless to dodge, it's behind. The ball she hit flew back and hit the zombie, causing him to fall over. Kim Junha caught the ball and continued, this combination fighting move took us a few days to come up with. If we fight properly, the results will be much better because we have prepared very carefully, he said proudly, holding the ball tightly in his hand. Through Garam's headset, he heard Kim Junha laughing. She was running at full speed and silently complained, it was distracting to turn on the walkie-talkie while fighting. Then she jumped up and punched the zombie in front of her, at the same time she told herself. Let's finish this quickly and move on, as expected, it's so unsettling, I have to go help everyone. Yu Yu was sent flying by the zombie, she let out a painful cry. She thought to herself, in order to gain everyone's trust, she promised not to use the sword when fighting, but without it, she couldn't fight. She looked at the zombie in front of her with difficulty, thinking, if this continues, I will become a burden to everyone. Damn it, somehow I'll fight with all my might, she thought as she charged towards the giant zombie. Shura spoke, it's not good to just stand there thinking, he said while blocking the zombie's attack towards Yu Yu. Rishiro smiled awkwardly and said, Sorry for being slapped in the face by the master, I'm late. It's hard to forget this excited mood. Then he looked at Yuyir and asked, But you are the weakest zombie, right? The commander told me. She looked at him helplessly and said, You really don't remember who I am. Rishiro replied, Who are you? Yuyir said, Never mind. Then he struck a blow that made the zombie behind him fall backwards, and continued, Anyway, I have to quickly go see my master, don't just stand there and quickly handle the situation. He smirked, looked behind him and continued, If you block my way, I'll leave you behind. Yu Yu confidently replied, don't worry, it reminded me of the old days. Over here Spetter is playing with Myri, she said, whoever doesn't come out loses the game of rock, paper, scissors. She shouted excitedly, winning again, and slapped Myri. Rock, paper, scissors, rock, paper, scissors, Spetter's joyful screams grew louder and louder as Myri was beaten. Spetter said happily, no, you don't seem to be good at this, why did you do what I said? Myri was beaten but his face had no emotion, he replied, I'm going to kill you anyway so it doesn't matter. Spetter laughed loudly, looking confident. She looked at Myri with a deadly gaze and continued, the brat the turret had an interest in was you, right? I was curious about you too, that's why I sent the invitation. Then she suddenly looked at Myri who was holding her hand and she held up two fingers and said, oh, I lost. She sat across from Myri and said, you only used your fists to beat me, meanwhile, Myri was spinning her hand to prepare to hit Spetter. She laughed happily and continued, you're warming up to beat me up. It must be really painful. Myri's hand shot close to Spetter's face but she calmly said, you are very strong and immortal. 
So the Dark Knight I was looking for seems to have found the right one. After saying that, she lay down to avoid Myri's attack. Myri missed Spetter's attack and looked at her in dissatisfaction. Spetter saw that and laughed and said sarcastically, Look at that face, I never told you not to dodge, you're such an idiot. Then she kicked Myri hard with both feet and said, No more playing around, there are a lot of things I want to verify. She kicked Myri away and asked, You too right, aren't you curious about me? Spetter clenched his fists. Then created a space with cracks behind, her face became fierce then she looked at Myri and said. Let's slowly get to know each other. The sun in the distance was slowly setting, revealing a breathtaking sunset. Spetter, when he was still human, said, I hate sunsets. Because when the sun goes down I feel like it's all going to be over. A friend turned back to her and there were a few more guys laughing. He replied, what? He looked at Spetter kneeling on the ground, she was crying and her body was covered in watercolor stains. Then he continued, what was that look on her face, playing so happily? Then smile, it's time to go home, he approached Spetter and said with a gentle face but inside was the soul of a devil. Spetter clasped his hands together. Open a barrier around Myri. Myri looked around in confusion and asked, what is it? Suddenly a puppet in the form of the boy who bullied Spetter appeared behind him. Then it pushed him down into another barrier. Myri regained his balance, he looked around again and wondered, where is this place? Spetter came forward and spoke, aren't you guys talking about Hongium Gate? She replied triumphantly, because to have you. I have blocked Terade's access. The puppet rushed towards Myri, he quickly dodged it. He punched the puppet. But when it passed through, its body reconnected, hugging his arm tightly. His legs and arms were completely covered by the puppet and he couldn't pull them out. He thought to himself, what a troublesome doll. Spetter looked at him struggling and smiled with pleasure, then she thought, don't be so impatient, you'll be here forever anyway. June looked at the computer in panic and exclaimed, what's going on? She couldn't believe her eyes and thought to herself, the commander's radio is disconnected, I don't know what's going on anymore. Even if I'm alone, I have to initiate hyperconvergence. Her eyes were filled with worry and anxiety as she looked at the computer screen, she thought to herself, but there was none. Chang Wan completely disappeared from the coordinates when viewed from the satellite, what the hell is going on? The sky suddenly changed color and cracks appeared, causing everyone to pay attention and look up. Yur Yur saw and wondered, what is it? Suddenly she collapsed to the ground. She breathed heavily, clutching her heart and thinking, it felt like something was being transmitted into her body, this was Spetter's command. Could it be because I was also a doll made from Spetter's thread? Yur Yur suddenly remembered something. She ran away leaving Rishuru alone to fight the giant zombie. He turned back and said, where are you going? Yur Yur thought to herself as she ran, the dolls were just hanging around the outer wall and not going inside, they only attacked humans and were not aiming for Changwon's collapse. I see, I should have noticed it sooner. She shouted through the walkie-talkie, Spetter had no intention of raiding Changwon, she was aiming for that human's lifespan. Look up at the sky. Spetter is turning that space into something incredibly dangerous, and the energy source needed to do so is human lifespan. Yur Yur replied to Garam as he ran. I thought so too, maybe Spetter had two abilities, I only received the order but I didn't know the details. She stopped and punched the ground with her fist and said about this place. Then she pulled up a glowing pillar from underground, Yu Yu said happily, great, found the source of energy. Yu Yu looked at the energy source and thought to herself, perhaps the number installed inside Changwon was around 100, it seemed like it was being prepared to activate, as soon as this was activated, the lifespan of the people here would gradually decrease. There's no way I'll let this happen, I have to destroy it before it activates. She thought and then released a fire to burn the energy source. Yur Yur looked up and thought to himself. The purpose of those 83 fake dolls was probably to install this energy source. It was indeed a rather elaborate plan. However, from the moment the incident occurred in the territory, failure was certain. Everything would not go according to your wishes, Spetter. Spetter suddenly sensed something. She said angrily, I completely forgot about you Yur Yur. In the hospital people were shouting, is anyone free, if so then come quickly. Jion Nuri lay motionless on the wheelchair, bleeding profusely. Everyone panicked and said, the commander is in critical condition, come help quickly. The doctor looked at Jussie and asked, damn, do you know what injured the commander, Jussie replied? I don't know, when we found the commander she was already unconscious. Heyong stood to the side worriedly saying, in critical condition. The doctor held his head helplessly and said, if it continues like this, we can't do anything. Heyong looked at the doctor and said loudly, impossible, is there no other way, can we just let the commander die like this? The doctor looked down at Chion Nuri and said, there is a way. Previously, in order to treat Jizian, Dr. Kyuho developed a treatment method. Heyong looked at the doctor in surprise. Then the doctor helplessly continued, I tried to ask him for help but he absolutely did not leave the room, so I... Before he could finish his sentence, Heyong quickly said, let me go, then ran away without letting the doctor finish his sentence. She ran to the door and shouted, Doctor, are you in there? There are many patients who need emergency care. Doctor, please come out and help them. Kyuho lay in the room holding his head in fear and said, No, I told you I can't, please go somewhere else. Heyong shouted, the commander was also in critical condition. Kyuho heard that and suddenly jumped up and said, what, even the commander? 
Heyong stood outside knocking on the door and replied with a pleading tone, the number of injured people will probably continue to increase so doctor must come help them, doctor please. Kyuho stuttered and trembled, even so it was not possible. Then he shouted, you killed that person, you have no right. You have no right to save people, Heyong heard that and wondered, what right, because of what right that even now the doctor still won't come out to help. She shouted angrily, saving people doesn't require qualifications, Kyuho heard that and suddenly stopped. Heyong continued, I don't have any ability so I can't do anything, while doctors have the ability to save people, yet you still sit there and differentiate between qualified and unqualified. She shouted with all her might, he was a doctor and doctors save people, that's all, saving people doesn't require qualifications. Doctor come help us quickly, Kyuho sat on the bed motionless thinking about what Heyong had said. Then Heyong burst into tears and ran away saying, okay, I won't ask the doctor anymore. While he was still sitting there, he thought back to the past. The only reason I wanted to become a doctor was simple, to be qualified. To save people. I have always been saving human lives. In a moment, he had run to the commander's hospital room, while running he silently blamed himself. How could he be so stupid? Heyong was right, there was no need for qualifications, or rather. Since when do I need qualifications? Then he grabbed the door of the hospital room. Tell everyone inside to get ready for me. He gasped and said, sorry I'm late, let's start the surgery. Dr. Kyuho ran in and gasped and said, sorry I'm late, let's start the surgery. In the room at that time Kyuho asked, the secret of the treatment method is to use Myri's blood, using Dr. Kyuho's ability. The doctor beside him asked him again, Myri's blood can heal? Are you kidding me? Kyuho replied, you guessed it right. It sounded like a joke but it was true. Myri's blood has the ability to heal itself to a certain extent, it will decide on its own whether to heal a suitable individual. The other party asked him again, do you mean the blood has its own will? Kyuho replied, yes, he was right. He held the blood treatment glass tube and said with a bit of fear and anxiety. My role is to help Myri's blood make positive choices. There's no reason why I wouldn't reveal this treatment method to you. It's just that I don't think this method is 100% complete yet. As for the preparations, I'm done, but I still need a few more things. The patient who gets the transfusion will have to overcome dopamine, ironically. This ability can only heal when the patient receives 100% of the pain with a body full of injuries. Although this treatment is nothing special, it is more difficult than I thought. Heyam ran in and shouted. Doctor, everything is ready. Kyuho replied. Let's proceed. Heyong replied. Yes. The doctor who ran after him kept thinking about Kyuho. Wasn't it something special? Finding a new treatment method wasn't easy at all. Just how great was his will to save people after all? This man is definitely more of a doctor than anyone else. During the fight between Kim Junha and the zombie, Junha caught the ball and said. Mei is really tough. Heimi appeared right behind Junha and said. Okay then. Let's go destroy the energy core. Senior Garam and that Rishuro guy will take care of this zombie. If not, Master Myri will come. Junha stood still listening to Haimi. We just need to do our duty. Don't waste any more time. Let's go. But Junha had no intention of leaving and said. Well, get out of here. Haimi heard that and said to Junha. Why are you so stubborn? We can't deal with this zombie. We've been fighting for so long and we still can't defeat it. Haimi looked at the wounds on Junha's hand and said. More than anything. How else do you want to fight with that hand? Haimi told Junha again. If you listen to me, let's go. Kim Junha also spoke up at this time. If we run away from here, that's all we'll get. Haimi shouted angrily again. Crazy. You're being unnecessarily stubborn. Suddenly Junha asked Haimi. Do you remember the day of the funeral? She wondered. What? Junha's hand was bleeding profusely, he threw the ball up and continued. After my father died in the massacre. I had an idea. Junha remembered that and said. Roll until I wear this armband. That will be that guy's funeral. I thought I would feel relieved when all the nagging stopped. To be honest, thinking about the funeral makes me feel really sad. Junha caught the ball and asked Haimi. Do you know what the good side of this era of wind destruction is? Whoever is strong can do whatever they want. Kim Junha shouted out a sentence of determination. I will become strong. And will live the way I want. Junha shouted again. Sorry but you will not die here because I will order you around for the rest of your life. Haimi just listened but said nothing more. Her tears just kept falling. Kim Junha used his injured hands to continue fighting. Junha's eyes flashed with a burning light. He seemed to let out a few cries. Then Junha took down the zombie with one move. The super throw. Six cylinders. The eyes of the monster created by Spetter suddenly shed tears. He dodged Junha's ultimate move. Kim Junha looked on with great disappointment. Damn it. He dodged this throw? I put all my strength into that throw. Suddenly, a sentence me too made Junha surprised. Haimi appeared right behind the monster and said. Since it's the time for the great wind to be destroyed, I'll score points. Then Haimi took the bat and hit the ball. Make that monster fall. 
And the monster created by Spetter fell, now it was Junha's super throw. At this point he was officially defeated. At this time, Haimi was a bit tired. She said while breathing. Quit smoking. What kind of high school student is smoking? Junha replied with a smile. Hey sister, you're usually as shy as a rabbit but I didn't expect you to do anything. After that, the two of them rested for a bit. Junha lay on the ground, he sighed and said. That's great, Haimi sat there and spoke up. Stubborn, I'm so tired of you. Then Haimi continued. Hey, wake up, we still have to destroy the energy core. Junha complained a little. I'm out of breath, can't you give me ten minutes? Really? However, the monster created by Spetter suddenly stood up. The two people saw it and exclaimed in panic. Hey, over there, what's going on? The monster rushed towards Haimi and Junha, she spoke to him first. Get up, hurry. Junha replied. Run, you idiot, get out of the way. Haimi ran while telling Kim Junha that she could still use her ability. Wait, I'll go somewhere else. Junha shouted a warning. Behind her. Haimi turned back and saw her and cried out. Kim Junha shouted even louder. I told you to stay away. Kim Haimi. Haimi closed her eyes tightly at this moment. Perhaps she was ready to accept what was about to happen. Luckily, at this moment Rishuru appeared and said, What is that smell? And Rishuru let out a soft cry. So it was the smell of love. Junha and Haimi said happily. Rishuru. The two of them were both happy and excited. This guy appeared at the right time. I told you he was trustworthy. Haimi sighed and said. Almost went to heaven. Rishuru laughed mockingly. Then Rishuru spoke up. Finally, my disciple has become close to me. Junha and Haimi looked at each other. Then they blamed Rishuru. Go away. Where did you come from to cling to this guy? Haimi also spoke up. Disgusting. Don't try to act friendly with me. They said that, making Rishuru a bit confused. Rishuru suddenly said. Really, I've been following you guys anyway. You two have improved by leaps and bounds. Damn it. Why do you always end up crying? Rishuru now opened his arms and continued. Everyone has worked hard. Come, take my hand. Now come with me. Even as he said that, Rishuru's tears were falling. It sounded ridiculous. But what Rishuru said was all from the heart. Without realizing it, he had begun to have more human emotions than zombies. Haimi looked at him with tired eyes. Thanks for saving me. But don't make such a fuss. I was just a little nervous. After all, we're zombies. We're just working together now. Rishuro let out a sound as if he understood. Rishuro thought to himself. That's right, I'm still an outcast after all. These kids can't get close to me. Suddenly Junha saw that the monster created by Spetter was still alive. Junha shouted. Hey, Rishuru, you haven't finished dealing with it yet? What's that? Rishuro still calmly wondered. Hey me and Junha complained. This guy, didn't you already finish dealing with it? But Rishuru replied at this moment. Actually, that's all I came here for. While these two were fighting, the other girl ran away. I thought it was strange so I chased after her. Who would have thought it would turn out like this? I happened to come across them. Thanks to that, he saw his disciples progress. Rishuru narrated the whole story. Now there was a complaint, crazy. Is that thing still moving? Rishuru, because of you, I have to face two of them now. One is enough to kill them. Rishuru reassured the two of them. Don't worry. Then a thunderous attack occurred. Rishuru stood there calmly and replied. They were really annoying. They recovered from minor injuries and their attacks were very formidable. They were really not easy to deal with. Seeing Rishuru like that, Junha and Haini said. That guy can fight and pose at the same time. But this, Rishuru said and laughed smugly and said. You can't make it difficult for me. Then Rishuru himself defeated the monster created by Spetter easily. Junha looked on in surprise. Controlling them at the same time. Rishuru smiled in response. There was nothing surprising about that. The monster created by Spetter was defeated and lying on the floor. Rishuro continued, when facing similar opponents, experience from previous battles is very useful. Knowing that fighting for a long period of time is just a waste of energy. Rishuro said a sentence while punching and rubbing. No need to feel hurt. This doesn't mean we're weak. It just means we're smarter. Then came the warning sound again. Rishuru. Behind. What's wrong? Those annoying dolls again? A figure was running after. Then he stopped to think. What is this feeling? Could it be? No, it can't be. Right now that guy. While fighting Myri. Suddenly Rishuru had a question. Rishuru felt something behind his back that made him wonder. Rishuru laughed and said. It's so frustrating having to deal with them one by one. Don't you guys have any fear crawling all the way here? Don't get in the way of my plans. Rishuru turned around and saw the opponent. Then another attack happened. Just couldn't see anything more. She flew away and said. Weak flies. 
Someone is talking to Garam through the device over here. Jean Garam, can you hear me? She replied. You're here, what's going on? The other end of the line continued. Spetter had appeared in person. Jean Garam replied. What was she talking about? Wasn't she fighting Myri in the air? Your year said. I thought so too. But it seems like Spetter has detained Myri and is directly here to deal with us. Garam asked back, detained. Suddenly she remembered, your year had guessed correctly. Remembered the person who brought the cake closer and said. Now open your mouth. Control the space. The person sitting next to Myri asked. How was it? It was really good right? Spetter had judged that mind control would not work. So he chose to control space over Myri. And this choice became an extremely effective tool to bind Myri. Garam asked again. So what should we do? Your year replied. Honestly, I don't think she will come down here directly. But maybe it's our chance? At this moment, Spetter flew in from somewhere, your year said to Garam. Don't worry. Your year kicked Spetter and said. I will get Spetter. Spetter smiled and said. I was looking for you but I didn't expect you to appear like this. Can't you destroy the energy core? Your year replied. No, I think instead of doing that. It would be more effective to capture you directly. Spetter laughed mockingly. You're so weak, yet you want to capture me. In my own space. Spetter used his big hand to beat your year and said. Don't be complacent because you think we are all managers. Your year, no matter how hard you try, you will only receive my blows. Spetter then commented. You can't beat me. Your year made a noise of annoyance and continued. That. Suddenly, something surprised Spetter. You won't know until you try. Your year fought Spetter. Then your year spoke through the device to Garam. Okay. She confronted me as expected. Everyone started walking. Spetter rushed to your year and said. Where are your eyes going? Garam then appeared with something thrown straight at Spetter. It caused Spetter to suffer a bit of physical pain and let out a painful scream. Your year asked again. How does it feel? Is this skill good? Spetter said angrily. You guys really want to catch me. Your year smiled and thought to himself. Capture Spetter? Of course. Your year said as she ran. If the entire energy core was destroyed, Spetter's energy would weaken and Myri could escape. This was the best way to increase her chances of winning this battle. Garam on this side also listened and ran. She heard your year continue. I will tell everyone the location of the energy core. Everyone destroy it while I deal with Spetter. Garam replied. Can you catch Spetter alone? Your year replied. It's okay. Because I'm not here alone. Your year said that because Rishuru was also here. Spetter was surprised to see Rishuru. What's this? You're still alive? Rishuru also said at this time. How dare you throw stones at my disciples? Your year smiled happily and said. I knew you would come. Rishuru. You came at just the right time. Rishuru shouted at this moment. Why are you standing there in a daze? This girl. Your year replied. Sorry. What can I do? This is a guardian too. Even if it takes effort. I'm confident I can handle it. Spetter shouted loudly now. You bastards. You take me for a joke. Get out of my sight. At this moment, Rishuru activated his ability. The path of the broken wings. The black yellow whirlpool. That afternoon, Spetter quickly dismissed it as a mosquito biting an elephant and said, What is this trivial attack? Your year fought hard. Spetter looked on and exclaimed. Really? Spetter quickly attacked again. Spetter's move was like a terrifying explosion. Junha below saw it and said. Amazing. I didn't expect them to last this long against Spetter. Kim Junha gritted his teeth and said. Even though he was very annoyed. But he still had to admit that they were also guardians. Suddenly, a voice called out. Hey, Kim Junha. Hurry up. He replied. I know. I'm on my way. As Kim Junha walked, Spetter's attack appeared from behind. Spetter was very strong, so facing Rishuru in your year was no problem. Haimi holds a weapon and destroys Spetter's power source. Spetter continued to throw more dimensions. Garam is here now. Spetter was extremely displeased to see Garam arrive. Destroyed all, all the energy cores. Garam heard that and said, is this okay? Your ear breathed heavily and laughed loudly, saying, it's over, Spetter. I don't know what you were dreaming up, but it's all over now. Your ear looked excited and thoughtful. Get out on Myri, just wait for him to finish. Your ear looked and wondered a bit. Why? Why is this happening? Why is nothing happening? It was obvious that her ability was related to the energy cores. Suddenly a loud laugh rang out. Spetter sneered. You stupid bugs, just in case something goes wrong I kept my powers for myself. Spetter rolled his eyes and said, there's no other way, I have to personally capture all of you. Then each person had strange expressions and feelings. Junha and Haini were also like that. 
and Rishuru was no exception. A shrill voice asked, What, Rishuru, what's wrong? Rishuru, before he could finish his sentence, Yir Yir was also affected. Then Yir Yir bowed his head to the ground and replied, Impossible. Without the energy core, can she still use her abilities? Yir Yir was stunned, what was going on? Rishuru and Yir Yir both collapsed to the ground. Spetter laughed loudly at this moment, Do you think everything is in the palm of your hand? Spetter laughed even more excitedly, Now your lifespan will be mine. I don't need to create infinite space anymore, my long-time dream has finally come true. Suddenly another voice rang out, Well done Yir Yir, that sentence made Spetter a little puzzled. Garam ran to Yir Yir and said, You've worked hard, Spetter looked at Garam, What is it, who is it? I've clearly taken away the lifespan of all living creatures here. Garam said at this time, Leave the rest to me. She said with determination, I will catch her at all costs. After that incident Garam sat and thought about it, after a while I learned something. What I thought was easy turned out to be much harder than I thought, when I got over a wall. Awaiting us ahead is a higher wall. The harder I tried, the more clearly I realized that I had reached my limit. Garam's face was filled with sadness. She looked at Yir lying motionless on the ground. She told Yir, you've worked hard, leave the rest to me. I will catch her at all costs. Garam charged forward at lightning speed. This made Spetter a little surprised, this was not it. Spetter laughed loudly and said, Godspeed? Garam's hand touched the ground. She continued to rush forward. Spetter then said, Oh look closely. Spetter stepped on Garam with one foot and said, You're the one who stood next to Rishuru, right? I understand roughly, you have the ability to preserve your life, right? Among the abilities of Freedians and Transcendence is the preservation of longevity. Garam's ability is the same, her lifespan is converted into energy thereby activating the ability to transmit knowledge. Therefore, her lifespan was already preserved, so Spetter couldn't steal it. Spetter's foot still stepped on her head and said, Normally this longevity guarantee ability allows the user to gain power beyond imagination. But yours is so weak. Sorry, but you're too weak to be my opponent. Spetter just smiled and smiled at this, she said happily. But don't worry, I'm in a good mood so I won't kill you. Spetter left Garam there and flew away, saying, Live well, Garam was filled with anger, I am weak, I know that. Garam then flew straight towards Spetter, surprising her a bit. But she was kicked mercilessly by Spetter and said, Why are you so annoying? Your ability is commendable but you have to know your limits, I don't have time to play with you. At this moment a hand caught her, Spetter complained again. What the hell is wrong with you, you think you have two lives? The bloody man holding Garam said. Benjamin John Pilsham, Spetter said again, What, are you out of your mind? Garam now had some strength and firmly said to Spetter. When Nadef failed to turn me into a mutant zombie, I knew luck couldn't balance out my abilities. Just like you said, I'm weak, so I only do what I can, Spetter replied, what nonsense. Then a green light appeared, making Spetter panic, you, what the hell are you doing? But martyrs who sacrificed for the country, do you know what these people are called? Spetter shouted loudly, let me go, damn it, isn't it just a rough diamond? Garam's face contained revenge and he said, the world calls them heroes. Spetter stood there, somewhat puzzled. The bright red ball suddenly changed. Spetter was now almost defenseless. A magical light emitted. Right behind her. Spetter now screamed in denial, no, her space. Then Spetter pushed Garam away and said, get out. Garam just fell down and Spetter flew over there and said, no. Jean Garam just fell down in despair. She seemed to have lost all concern for the world. Garam's eyes closed. And then Garam fell down with her body covered in blood, she fell into someone's arms. Garam tried to open his eyes and speak, senior. The man cried and said, Jean Garam, are you crazy, what the hell are you doing, you know you can't use your powers carelessly. Jean Garam thought unconsciously, why a senior here, Spetter has clearly stolen his lifespan. In her subconscious, Jean Garam still said, how annoying, but this senior, you turned into a mutant zombie like this, you are more handsome. In her eyes, the senior's image became blurry and blurry. She only knew that the senior was crying and telling her, open your eyes, Jean Garam. She also added that the senior was not this handsome before. The senior hugged her and shouted, Jean Garam, open your eyes. Jean Garam. The senior was now crying his eyes out for Garam. Spetter looked at the thing above and thought, crazy, crazy, really crazy, what the hell is going on? For a moment, I felt my space being twisted. Suddenly a voice called, Spetter, making her wonder who it was. The senior's eyes suddenly became angry as he rushed towards Spetter and said, I absolutely will not forgive you, she thought to herself, what now? I already took away my lifespan, where did this guy come from? Senior attacked Spetter, she could only sigh, really. And then she shouted, if you can't even fight, what good can you do, go away. The senior was thrown out and hit the red ball. Spetter complained again, one girl then another, what a pain, then she yelled, a bunch of weaklings. Spetter punched his senior in the face and said, why do you keep ruining my plans? Spetter hit and ordered, go away, go away for me. I said go away, you. 
At this moment, the senior cried bitterly for Garum and shouted loudly at Spetter, You are the weak one, you cowardly bitch. Spetter was very surprised, she asked, What? Spetter was agitated, she rushed forward and asked again, Weak, weak? Me. Spetter choked the other and said, Say it again, I'm not weak. The senior let out a few soft cries as if he could no longer breathe. Spetter asked again, What do you think? Am I right? Then she took up her weapon and attacked the opponent and said, You useless bastard, what kind of person are you to dare talk to me? The weapon Spetter was holding got closer and closer to its target, and then missed the senior and hit Hano instead. Spetter saw that and panicked, What is it? Joy Hano? What about you? Spetter's eyes were filled with disbelief. And that thing broke and everything it contained fell down. Cakes and candies are falling down in abundance. Spetter shielded herself from these things with her hands, wondering what the hell was going on. That side was already weak. The senior was also shedding tears of pity for Jean Garum, Spetter glanced. Macarons fell down. Myri then went to Spetter and said, You still did something to them, don't be so mean. That side is weak. Myri said as he walked on the cake-filled road, colorful cakes were under his feet. You still hit them, don't be so cowardly. Myri held a small cake in her hand, held it in front of Spetter and continued speaking. Spetter, who had just lost his arm, looked up at Myri in pain. Suddenly he let the cake fall freely in front of Spetter. She opened her eyes wide and followed it. Spetter's face faded. In an instant, on Myri kicked Spetter, sending her flying into a wall. This moment Myri heard a pitiful cry, Myri turned her head to look towards the direction of the sound. Myri grabbed Dongo's collar and pulled him up. Enough, don't save me, Dongo said helplessly. I checked everything. The commander, Kuo, even Garam, they were all killed by Spetter, Dongo tried to say. Myri looked at him and pulled him up high. What's the point of living in this world anymore, Dongo kept being pessimistic. He looked like he had no strength left. It's all over, Dongo confirmed. Myri looked at him and didn't say a word. A scene of desolation appeared before his eyes. Spetter's figure was lying there after Myri's kick, she was saying something. Suddenly Spetter opened her mouth and laughed loudly, so you're still alive, my black knight, she said mockingly. The rumors that you're not dead are true. Spetter quickly sat up, as if nothing had happened. I was so worried that all my space had disappeared at once, she added. I just need to recreate the lost space, I still have human lifespan in my hands after all. Spetter grinned and thought evilly. Just you wait, I'll lock you back in my space, she thought happily. Ha! Huh? What did you just say? Someone asked. Didn't you hear? Someone else replied. One of their legs appeared. I said Spetter killed everyone, even if you don't share my sadness, you can still take revenge with me. With tears streaming down his face, Dongo angrily shouted at the person opposite him. I told you so, that person said. There's no need to do that, Myri looked at Dongo and said. You, you're so annoying. I thought you still had some humanity left in you. Dongo continued, disappointed in Myri. Hey, why are you two arguing? I heard you were going to get revenge or something, but it seems like you have a disagreement? Spetter suddenly spoke up, then suddenly appeared behind Dongo. Dongo turned around in surprise and said loudly. Spetter. Okay, Myri, if you don't do it, I will. Myri still stood there. Dongo pushed his hand towards Myri, crying loudly. Only by taking revenge will I not feel ashamed of those who heroically sacrificed themselves. Dongo gritted his teeth and swallowed his tears, looked at Spetter and angrily said to Myri, Stay there, don't get in my way, I will personally finish off Spetter. Myri with a cold face, did not stop Dongo and said, Well, whatever you want. Dongo quickly ran towards Spetter, she was still crossing her arms, laughing gleefully, looking down on Dongo and saying, You just rushed in like that? Dongo threw a punch at Spetter but she easily dodged it, saying happily, That's fierce, okay, I'll be your opponent then, because I'm not in a hurry right now. Let me see how long you can endure, Spetter suddenly raised his hand and threw a move. A block of wood rose from the ground and stabbed straight into Dongo's body, causing him to spit out blood and let out a painful cry. Not giving up, Dongo quickly escaped from the block of wood and flew straight to Spetter, who stood still and waited. He spoke aggressively, his ability to withstand blows was indeed not bad, she praised him a bit. Once again, Dongo was knocked out by Spetter, unable to defend. Myri was still watching the battle between the two. There was a device on Myri's ear, it was currently glowing, Myri still didn't make any movement. Dongo coughed and fell, his knees hitting the ground hard. Spetter laughed loudly, what is this guy, already tired, she pointed at him and said gleefully, Dongo had already collapsed. He covered his face to prevent more blood from flowing, didn't he say he would take revenge, this is really harmful. Spetter kept looking down on Dongo and said. Well, you're a rare type, a mutant zombie who actually helps humans. Spetter looked up at the sky and twiddled his fingers as he added, I thought you were just a newbie, but I didn't expect your physical strength to be so outstanding. Suddenly Dongo's eyes were full of murderous intent, tears still flowing, he slowly spoke, ha, huh, damn it. Dongo shouted at Spetter with an extremely angry voice, he wanted to move towards Spetter. Not giving Dongo time to do anything, she pointed at Dongo's head, a big hole appeared on his head, he fell backwards, Spetter smiled slyly and said, that's too noisy. If you have a mouth, then speak. What's the point of screaming all the time? Spetter said to Dongo's corpse with annoyance. 
Honestly, it was quite interesting. In the end, Dongo collapsed. You're colder than I thought, Spatter turned around and smiled eerily at Myri who was standing behind him, I thought you were on the human side, but this is probably not the case, she said with amusement. Hope you didn't choose the wrong side, Myri slowly took action, he removed the device on his ear, to tell you the truth, I'm tired now too, Spatter added to Myri. Myri looked up at her and replied, okay, it's over now, suddenly, Dongo stood behind Spatter, smiled, and said, really, Spatter was so startled that she stood there with a pale face. What the hell, I clearly shot through the head just now, she thought in surprise and turned around, Spatter's eyes clearly showing surprise. Suddenly Dongo hugged Spetter not letting her move, she screamed in panic, let me go, how dare you? Spetter suddenly discovered something, gritted his teeth and opened his eyes wide to look in one direction. What the hell, something just happened in the sky, the longevity gems I accumulated were gradually disappearing, the image of the two gems slowly fading appeared right before Spetter's eyes, she thought in doubt. At this moment, Dongo was still hugging Spetter tightly and not letting go, then smiled and said, thank you for your cooperation, thanks to you we have time, what do you think of my acting? Spetter lowered his head and said nothing. What an act, Spetter couldn't believe what she was hearing, she thought in confusion. Dongo recalled, Senior, Garam, are you awake? Dongo asked with tears in his eyes. I'm fine, calm down and listen to me, Garam reassured Dongo. No matter what, I won't die, to catch Spetter, I'll try to buy some time for you. Garam's face was covered in blood as he instructed Dongo what to do, he would return everyone's lifespan. With Garam's request, Dongo thought of the best way to help her, which was acting. Back to the scene where Myri grabbed Dongo's collar and flew up, Myri, got it, I'll act like I want to get revenge on Spetter, Dongo said. Is it necessary to do that? Myri asked curiously, Dongo turned his face up and said to Myri, What, you already know the situation through the in-ear headphones? Hey, let's start quickly, Spetter will be here soon, Dongo urged Myri to hurry, Myri didn't say anything more. Huh, what did you just say? Myri asked, didn't you hear? Dongo asked back, they must have started acting. I said Spetter killed everyone, even if you don't share my sadness, we can still take revenge together, Dongo pretended to cry miserably. Told you, there's no need to do that, Myri helplessly turned her face away and said, Dongo cried and grimaced, blaming Myri. Whisper to him, what are you doing, quickly pretend to match, I tried so hard to shed tears, this guy, Dongo complained resentfully. Anyone who looked at it could see that this was a plan that had not been carefully discussed, but it was carried out extremely smoothly, which was no surprise. It was thanks to Dongo's skills that this was an extremely silly plan. Garam lay on the ground, closed her eyes and smiled, really, he is always helpful in such a strange way, she helplessly said about Dongo. Back to the present, Spetter's face showed anger, she shouted. Right now, Myri, end it, Dongo hugged Spetter while trying to urge Myri to quickly end it, Spetter was still looking at Myri in surprise. No, don't come here, Spetter shouted, telling Myri to stop. Meanwhile, Myri quickly flew towards her. Are you going to kill me and this mutant zombie? She turned to ask Myri. Let me go, let me go, she was furious, struggling to get away from Dongo. You will die like this you idiot, Spetter said loudly to Dongo. Ha, huh, what did you leave behind? Dongo asked Spetter curiously, I never held you back. Dongo stood behind her with his arms crossed and smiled as he asked her. Spetter startled and cowered, looking back at the empty space, then she exclaimed in surprise, what? Let me tell you something interesting, I wasn't shot through the head in the first place, the image that appeared just now, I also never held you tight for a single moment, Dongo affirmed to her. From the way you look at it, it looks like I'm holding you tight, Dongo continued, Spetter turned his head in surprise and shouted, what the hell are you talking about? Attacking the chaos, Dongo smiled and pointed to his head, saying, that's the ability I got after becoming a mutant zombie. Thanks to you, I was able to improve my ability, he looked at Spetter with disdain and gratitude. This dog, is he a Freudian, she roared angrily when she found out, Spetter's eyes filled with resentment. Myri's first move, without letting Spetter say much, Myri's hand split into dozens of fingers, creating a terrifying purple circle of power, blood gushing out, Myri called out the move's name. The tremendous power that Myri released hit Spetter directly, destroying the entire sky and shattering the earth and rocks. All the places that the attack touched were severely destroyed, loud explosions covered a wide space. Oh my god, the first time I saw this attack, Dongo's face turned pale, his mouth opened in disbelief, this Myri brat is no different from a monster, Dongo thought to himself. What the hell, Spetter couldn't withstand that attack and had to take it all, she was lying under the rubble gasping for breath, compared to the initial attack, this one was even more terrifying, Dongo compared. Myri slowly walked closer to Spetter, she realized so she quickly sat up. Dealing with those brats, plus having to collect life, I've used too much power, she gritted her teeth and thought angrily, I took such a surprise attack, I have to control this bastard, maybe Spetter is looking for a way to escape. Myri's footsteps got closer and closer, he walked with a cold, emotionless expression, with no intention of stopping, could he do it? Myri ran to Spetter's side, she panicked and tried to stand up, had to stand up. Get up, I told you to get up, Spetter's mind wanted to get up but her scarred body didn't allow it, I still have an unfinished goal, Spetter thought firmly. I still have to let Hanno, a smiling blonde haired boy who appeared in Spetter's mind, taste the so-called infinite punishment, she thought about it. At this moment, Myri coldly raised her fist, preparing to attack Spetter again. She closed her eyes tightly, trying to urge herself, Spetter tried, she wouldn't allow herself to give up. Get up quickly, the image of the boy from earlier appeared in front of Spetter and smiled, Myri's fist stabbed straight into Choi Hanoa's chest from behind, and Spetter just sat there looking at that image. Choi Hanoa's image appeared in front of Spetter and smiled, Myri's fist stabbed Choi Hano straight in the chest from behind, and Spetter just sat there looking at that image. 
Choi Hano, what about you? Spetter opened her eyes wide in surprise and asked Choi Hano, I didn't order you, she wondered, Hano was still standing in front of her. An arm struck Spetter straight on the side of her neck, catching her off guard. Her face was covered in blood, showing a look of utter surprise. Choi Hano, she called out the boy's name in surprise, Myri looked at her bloody hand and said, I knew it, Choi Hano said nothing despite Spetter's blood flowing. Suddenly he smiled with satisfaction at Spetter. Back in the past, Hano, a girl with brown hair, held a gift box forward and shyly said, this is a Valentine's gift. Can you, she said to Choi Hano with her face down, go on a date with me? You don't know me, Choi Hano asked, the girl hesitated, blushed and replied, you are Choi Hano 52. I see, okay, let's date, Choi Hano's face was sly, smiling and agreeing to the girl's proposal. I knew then, something was wrong. The girl's face was haggard, she lay on the floor lifeless, perhaps something had happened to her. Why did you do this to me? Her lifeless eyes asked Hano, why are you like this? What? Aren't we dating? Choi Hano's face turned red as he explained his actions, can't you do as I want? Thinking that was enough, Hano looked at her lying on the floor and continued, let's have fun together. Her shoeless, wounded feet stepped out into the street. She walked down the street with scars all over her body. Everyone around turned their eyes to her strangely. In her hand she was holding something red that was crushed. Her face was lifeless and devoid of human vitality. The door opened, your home, mom cooked dinner, a child said. The girl said nothing as she entered the room and closed the door, the child turned to look at her in surprise and asked, sister, a blade suddenly stabbed straight into the middle of the red doll, Choi Hano took my life. I can't go back to my previous life. The image of the angry girl repeatedly stabbing the red doll on the bed appeared. I will go back to living as if nothing happened. No, it can't be, every red thread from the doll flew out. Doesn't he deserve to be punished? Spetter stood there panting, looking at the player Hano covered in blood and red threads, along with a few others. What? What do you think? Is this fun? She angrily shouted at Hano, does this look like a game? Answer me. Spetter shouted, Choi Hano's face was full of red lines and he smiled mockingly at Spetter. Is that all? Hano asked. Spetter's eyes widened in surprise. The revenge you've prepared, is that all? Choi Hano brought his face close to Spetter's and smiled smugly. She looked at him with white eyes. Choi Hano waved his hand and pushed Spetter to fall backwards, coldly saying, how bland. Myri stood outside, looking at what was happening in front of him, not understanding anything. He thought, what is this? Because I wanted to see his suffering, I kept my original body and made it into a doll. Spetter thought as she fell down, never expecting things to turn out like this. She couldn't believe it was true. Sorry but Choi Hano, white hair fluttering, it's not over yet, Spetter thought. I will also take away my life, suddenly she turned into another monstrous form, white hair and a skinny black body. The surrounding space also changed along with Spetter's body, Choi Hano and Myri remained standing still. Suddenly, some force made Choi Hano fly up, and there was something strange about the red thread Myri had punctured earlier. A huge gift box sucks Choi Hano inside. Myri looked up to see what was happening. Unfortunately, Spetter is in a state of aging and gradually fading away, Choi Hano said. I wanted to see it with my own eyes, Spetter said regretfully, then disappeared into thin air. At this moment, Myri was quickly blown up. Thinking to himself, she was being sucked in, he firmly planted his feet on the ground, splitting one leg into three, so that he wouldn't fly up. The big gift box that was still moving in the sky, was because of that thing, Myri realized and then questioned. What? The building was shaking. Someone was shouting loudly, Kyuho woke up. What happened? Did I faint? He asked in confusion. Doctor, are you awake? A girl quickly ran up to Kyuho and asked. What's going on? Kyuho asked the girl. The building is currently, no, the girl hesitated. It seemed like the whole Changwon was shaking. The girl said, the whole sky was shaking strangely. Wake up. Hey, hey, someone is calling your ear. She slowly woke up with the call. Wake up. Please. The ponytailed girl screamed. She grabbed your ear's sleeve and pulled her up. Your ear calmly looked at the girl and asked, what's going on? I'm clearly fighting Spetter. If you're awake, then let's try our best. The ponytailed girl said firmly. Hey, what happened? Your ear asked, not understanding anything. I don't know either. I was passing by and saw you. Then suddenly you were sucked up into the sky. The girl replied. Damn it, even if I tried to ignore it, how did it turn out like this? She had helped our camp back then too. Your ear's face was filled with panic as if she had discovered something. Looking back, she was the person who was next to Myri at that time. Your ear suddenly remembered the image of a familiar girl. At this moment, Myri's side was still standing on the legs that were firmly planted on the ground. He looked up and attacked something in the sky with his feet. The bones he threw nearby all dissolved, having no effect. What should he do? He was confused. A scream rang out. A man fell from there. Myri quickly flew over and helped him up. Myri supported him and flew to where Yuri and Garam were standing. Myri, you're here? What the hell is that? 
Dongo asked Myri in panic. I don't know. Myri replied. Dongo tried to hug Garam. The displacement still hadn't disappeared. Garam had to be held tight, he said. Really, what the hell is that thing supposed to do with it? Yu Yu asked helplessly. Clasping his arms, Garam tried to speak. What? Dongo asked. Senior, you weren't sucked into the sky, it was me. It will suck in people who wear the bracelet and those around them. Garam looked at the bracelet and explained. It's aiming at me, Myri or your year. She was doubtful. What? So everything around was destroyed until one of the three people was sucked in. Dongo asked her in panic. Everything around was destroyed, no longer intact. If this continued, the entire Changwon would be sucked away. He continued worriedly. Myri looked towards Garam and Dongo understood and said nothing. We fight to protect something. Myri recalls the image of him and Kim Jiho and what his grandfather told him. The end result of this punch is the reason why the student must win. He held his hand out in front of him. I'll fight it. As soon as he finished speaking, he flew straight towards that place, much to Dongo's surprise. Wait, do you know what's inside? Dongo worriedly stopped him. I'm not dead anyway. Myri replied to Dongo softly. It's not that. What if you were locked up and couldn't get out like just now? Dongo asked him in a panic. We'll figure it out. Dongo tried to persuade him. Garam lay still and said nothing. Come back here. Hurry. Dongo urged Myri to come back quickly. It's okay. Myri firmly told Dongo and he continued flying up there. On Myri. Kyoho Heyong and Jizian looked up at the sky with panicked faces. I can do it. Myri thought to herself as she looked up at the place. Because I fight to protect everyone. Suddenly a foot appeared above Myri. It stopped on his head and said. No, that won't do. He still couldn't leave this place. Yur Yur appeared above him. Preventing him from going there. Myri was kicked down by her. The tremors were still running through the city. Trees were falling. Whatever it was, we had to hold on tight. Was it an earthquake or something? People were panicking and comforting each other. I don't know what the situation is, but it's definitely going to get worse. Kyuho thought as he ran away from there. Spetter's dolls will take this opportunity to rush in through the front door. He was worried. His face looked serious. Kyuho frowned and thought. If that's the case, I have to stop this. A kick went straight at Myri's head. He didn't have time to dodge. It was your year. She was flying above Myri. Kick Myri to the ground. What are you doing? Myri asked your year, looking at her blankly. What are you up to? She looked at him and smiled. Don't get in my way. If you don't want to die, then go somewhere else. Myri determinedly flew straight up into the sky once more. Your year turned her head to follow his actions and said, What cruel words. But sorry. Your year suddenly used his flaming sword to slash hard at Myri's body. Cut you in half. I won't let you go that easily. She continued. Because the goblin is lending me its power. Your year said happily. Beside her was a fire shaped like a goblin's face. If you want to leave, you'll have to step over my dead body. She affirmed. Get down. Your year advised him. Myri turned to look at her coldly. The humans needed him. Hold on tight. If you fly away, you'll die. One said. What is that? Another asked. What? Your year and Myri. Under the giant gift box. Two beams of light are fighting each other. Myri bit hard on your year's hand. She struggled uncomfortably. She immediately used the sword to slash Myri's neck. They chased each other in the air. They moved very quickly from place to place. Two black and red spots fight each other. Endless. The red dot immediately flew across the black dot. Just like your year just pierced Myri, causing his limbs to be severed. You're not looking down on me, are you? Myri frowned and said to your year, I told you. There is no other way but to kill me sincerely. No your year glanced at Myri and smiled. The thought of really wanting to kill me. Your year swung his sword towards Myri. Continued to attack him. Myri took the hit and fell backwards. Myri slowly fell to the ground. His hands were still raised as if he wanted to grab onto something. The intimate image between him and Yuryir gradually appeared in his memory. They talked to each other. Meet up with friends. Have dinner with Jizian and Heyong. And Yuryir cried during that meal. Yuryir smiled with satisfaction. Thank you, Yuryir, let go. Let that giant box suck her in. It gave me such beautiful memories. Yuryir has no regrets. Myri was startled to discover Yuryir's intention and immediately reached out to catch her. Myri's arm separated from her body. It flew straight towards Yuryir. That arm flew so fast. But as it approached, it slowly faded away with your ear. She was sucked in completely. Farewell, my friend. Things around started to collapse. Shards of glass began to fall. The two people just now were confused and tried to stand firm because of the collapse of the glass pieces. 
Kim Junhai and Kim Haimi, who were supporting Rishuro, also looked around in surprise at the sudden collapse. The humanoid dolls also gradually disappeared with the shaking. Shang Wan, someone shouted, turned back as before. Myri's arm also returned. Myri lay under the rubble, raising her hands to look towards where Yu Yir disappeared. He was silent, not saying a word. His lips were pressed together. Tears flowed, his hair covered his sad eyes. What to do now? This is the infinite space that Spetter devoted all his life to creating. Of course this space will never disappear, the goblin said. It continued, in this place, Spetter's dolls would not die but be revived. If I analyzed it calmly, I would also become an existence that could not die. Maybe you will be stuck in this place forever, Joy Hanoa's image appeared and fought with that brat. You must know that everything is due to your karma, because you used my power to commit so many sins. The elf analyzed. Entering this place is also the place to remove all karma, isn't it? It is also the person who awakened the ego in my body created by Spetter, right? Yur Yur said. Really, alright, Yur Yur turned around holding the flaming sword and said firmly, I will fight no matter how long it takes. Something surprised Kyu Ho. He opened his eyes wide. Hoyoung, in front of him was Hoyoung sitting next to Ha Chun who was seriously injured. His face was covered in tears. What is this? Kyu Ho asked in panic. Hold on a little, I'll do it now. Kyu Ho hurriedly ran to his side and said. It's too late. Hoyoung looked down and said sadly. This idiot, if he just asked for help, he wouldn't have ended up like this. Hoyoung said with tears in his eyes. To protect the hospital, he stood alone at the entrance. When I arrived, it was too late. I don't know who to tell. He said. Kyuho looked at the two of them blankly. He smiled because he sacrificed his life to save everyone. Hoyoung added. This idiot, the two of them stood by Hachun's body and said nothing more. Suddenly Garam lying on the ground coughed a few times. Dongo immediately ran over to ask. Garam, are you okay? Senior. Everyone. She said. Honestly. Who's worried about who? It's all noisy. Let's go to the hospital. He looked at her helplessly. He smiled and replied. It was all over. Myri just sat there. Unmoving. He had just lost a friend. A few days later. The sky is clear. Everyone, please be careful. Someone reminds. This way. Take it easy. Don't push yourself too hard. A group of people are cleaning up after the battle. You guys come over here and help us. They're dividing the work. He sacrificed his life. A man holding Ha Chun's shirt said. If Garam knew about this, she would be heartbroken. You have worked hard. Thank you very much. The person continued. Indeed. A genius like you. Should have become a fireman. Ha Chun's name was stuck in the ground. His shirt was on it. Kyuho bowed his head and prayed before Ha Chun's grave. Praying? Someone asked Kyuho. Well sorry to interrupt your prayer but there is no god in this world. Praying? It's pointless. Chion Nuri stood beside Kyuho on crutches and said. Commander, are you awake? Kyuho turned to Chion Nuri in surprise and asked. As the commander, how could I fall? Chion Nuri replied. Kyuho opened his mouth in surprise and thought. It was a miracle that she survived with so many injuries. She had more than just the title of commander. Kyuho admired her. Didn't you just say that praying is useless? Kyuho wondered. It's meaningless to me. Chion Nuri looked at him. For those who have passed away, it might have meaning. She replied sadly. Kyuho heard that and sighed with a smile. Is that so? Chion Nuri bowed her head and prayed. She was praying. Kyuho asked. Myri, we have to go. The sun is about to set. Someone called Myri to leave quickly. Um. He replied absent-mindedly. Jizian and Heian walked up to Myri with a smile. Myri glanced back at them. In a wide open space, your year's sword is still stuck there. We will come visit you again. By dusk, all the Hongsung gates around Busan had disappeared. A great war would soon break out. All three of Kim Junha, Kim Haimi and Rishuru are in the hospital getting their wounds bandaged. Dongo, Garam, and another person were also in the hospital. They were staring intently at something. Chion Nuri on this side was the same. She looked at him with a serious face. Myri's face was blank, cold, and emotionless. The enemy remains now. Only one person, a man with pigtails, wearing a mask and a sword slung over his waist appeared. What appeared before my eyes was a barren, empty land. Oh, you're awake? You're awake sooner than I thought. Neria looked at the girl and said. Oh, you're awake? Sooner than I expected. Neria asked her happily. Lee Kyung woke up, sweating profusely, the wound on his neck almost healed. How could that be? I, Lee Kyung, sat up in surprise. She was lying on a stretcher in a ruined place, surrounded by rocks and dirt. Neria was pressing the remote control and talking to her. You can't try too hard, because you still can't adapt. Her body was being recreated by combining corpses and machines. 
She had to wait until her nervous system got used to it. Naria explained to Lee Kyung. She turned her head to Naria and asked in wonder. My body was being recreated? It's unbelievable, I thought I was dead. She raised her hand to examine it. It was indeed different from her previous hand. I didn't expect someone to actually save me, Lee Kyung said in surprise. Lee Kyung recalled what happened earlier. I will make good use of this body. Naria excitedly dragged Lee Kyung's bloody body away. No, I can't die. Naria was surprised to hear her speak. Alive. Naria asked in surprise. I have to go save my comrades. Lee Kyung tried to speak in pain. She still couldn't find Senior Tarim so she stuttered. Don't worry, I was going to save you anyway. Naria said with a smile. Thanks to you, the troubles have been reduced a lot. I will pass on your regards to my friend. Naria explained. I was in a state of half-consciousness and thought I saw something. It turned out that I was really being dragged away. She suddenly remembered that. If I remember correctly, your name is Naria. Thank you for saving me. Lee Kyung turned to thank Naria. Naria continued her work. It's nothing. I saved you because I needed you. Naria said calmly. Oh yeah, I did read your thoughts a bit. Naria turned to Lee Kyung and said. I was about to say hello to her but couldn't say anything. See what I mean? Lee Kyung didn't understand so he asked Naria again. If so, Lee Kyung hesitantly said. I can feel the message in my head now. Did you leave it? She looked at Naria and asked. What message? I didn't leave anything. Naria replied in surprise. Oh, yes, the troubleshooting is done. Let's go now. Naria said. Go meet your friend. Naria eagerly flew up. Lee Kyung sat on the stretcher and watched Naria. I have my clothes over there. You can do it yourself. Okay. Goodbye. With that, Naria flew away. Said to go see first, now say goodbye. All the talking was confusing. Lee Kyung thought, the clothes were almost unwearable. Lee Kyung raised his hand to touch his forehead and grimaced, thinking, if it wasn't for Naria's setup then. She suddenly turned her face to the far side. Looking at the towels hanging on the tree. If I could, I would run away right now. But I can't. She thought, reaching for a nearby towel. She put it on and walked away from there. I can't go back yet. At the hospital. Hey, Myri's here too. Let's start the routine checkup. Just turn that way. Someone is talking. You're here? Myri opened the door and walked in, surprised. What do you think? What do you think? Does it suit me? Heyoung happily stood in front of Myri and smiled. Why are you late? I've been waiting for a long time. Why is she here? Myri wondered. You were surprised when I suddenly appeared here, right? Lately, while helping Dr. Kyuho, I learned a lot of things. Heyoung said excitedly. Thanks to that, I took over the busy June and took over the injections. Myri was still lying on the hospital bed. Oh, I'll have time to talk to Myri, just the two of us. She held the syringe and covered her face happily. I'm so happy. No, wait. Heyoung suddenly realized something. She paused to think. How could she be happy now? If this medicine works, it means Myri will die. She looked at the syringe in her hand and thought. Wouldn't that mean Myri will die by my hand? Myri lay on the bed looking at Heyoung, not understanding. Heyoung said, startled. I'm sorry, I'll do it quickly. You know, Myri, if this medicine works, you won't be able to see everyone anymore. She hesitantly said to Myri, who was lying quietly on the bed. Don't you regret it? She was worried about him. Maybe so, he said. Heyoung looked up at him and said. So that's it. At this time, Chiyong Nuri was sitting in a chair writing something. After the Spetter raid, there were minor changes in the task force. We reorganized the army to use the task force more effectively. Each team leader would stay in his area. Their role was to train the next group of troops and protect the camps. As for the lack of individual guns, to make up for this. The blue-haired girl opened the door and said to Chiyong Nuri, the commander, show me the picture. We've started researching new equipment. Jun clenched her fists and continued. I already have estimates for all the guns and personal autos. Now all we need is enough orchids. Good, you've worked hard so go and rest, Chiyo Nuri praised Jun. I can't rest until the commander is satisfied. Jun said excitedly. No, please go and rest, Chiyo Nuri said. Will the glasses I made for the commander fit? Jun asked shyly, thank you, Chiyo Nuri answered helplessly. Oh, Jun is here too. Commander, I have something to report. Garam walked over to Jun and said. Did I receive a radio call from the Hongium border gate? Garam said, from the back border, Turret has started to act. Chiyo Nuri asked curiously, yes. Roughly as the commander had predicted, it seemed that Turret had no intention of attacking humans. Garam said with a serious face. That's the prediction, but there's also a difficulty for us. Chiyo Nuri crossed his arms over his chin and thought. It would be easier for them to come up with a strategy if they attacked. The humans and zombies were fighting each other, using the Hongium gate as a benchmark. 
If one side started to act, war would break out. On the contrary, both sides were testing each other. If in this situation, they don't choose to fight, then they intend to isolate humans. Current health situation and resources are very limited. No matter how we think about it, we will only be wasting away, not having sustainable resources. On the enemy side, the facilities and reproductive resources are extremely rich, the zombies exploit the labor force to become rich. The more confrontation, the more advantage the zombies have. This plan of theirs is not good at all, unexpectedly acting so cowardly. Do they mean to avoid a useless fight? Chiyo Nuri thought. If the zombies didn't cross the Hongium gate boundary, then where did they go? Chiyo Nuri looked at Garam and asked. Although they didn't follow them closely, they tried to follow them as much as possible and confirmed that they were collecting orchids. Garam replied. Chiyo Nuri frowned in annoyance but continued to take notes. Orchids? June asked. Did they know? June panicked and grabbed Garam's hand. What? Garam looked at June in surprise. Orchids were an essential flower in war. No matter what the material is, as long as you have orchids, the effect will double. Not only that, based on the synthesis method it is also used as a new source of energy. This glowing flower is an orchid. Commander, now to rate, Chiyo Nuri slammed the pen down on the table and said. I thought so too, I thought he was cowardly, but he's actually very bold, right? Turret, is preparing for war, she said. Garam, Myri, and the Orchid members of Team 1 immediately set out to collect the flowers. Chiyo Nuri ordered, is it okay? If a great war happens, Garam hesitantly asked her, it's okay, she reassured. Their actions tell us that they need to prepare. Chiyo Nuri analyzed. Jun was surprised to hear her say that. If we are not ready, we cannot risk any war. Furthermore, war happens regardless of cause and effect. Chiyo Nuri slammed her hand on the table resolutely. We need orchids now too, whether we like it or not, we have to fight. With the remaining time, we will start a war for orchids. She decided. Myri and Team 1 are moving somewhere. Commander, Team 1 is moving towards the orchid collection area. Someone reports the situation to Chiyo Nuri's side. Chiyo Nuri stood by the window looking out and said to herself. Let me see how you appear this time. I confirmed a group of humans moving. A man in a black hood walked up and spoke to Tarate. They would soon reach the collection point. The first fierce battle has begun. Go. Tarate ordered the hooded man. Me? The man replied. It's better to have a clear strategy. He said. So that's it. The turban man began to open his turban. I understand. Awa, the third arahant of Tarate. Commander, this is Chang Wan's internal patrol. Someone is calling Chiyo Nuri. Why does the internal patrol have a walkie-talkie? She turned to look at the phone and wondered. An intruder appeared inside Chang Wan. Chiyo Nuri was startled when she heard the news. Why is there an intruder suddenly? Chiyo Nuri panicked and picked up the walkie-talkie, thinking. I didn't receive any news about them crossing the Hongian border, did I? There was only one intruder in sight. The other side continued. Chiyo Nuri lost patience and asked the other side. What's going on? Tell me your current location. Internal patrol. She shouted. Damn it. Chiyo Nuri ran out. When did that person break in? She thought in confusion. No, he must have been hiding for a long time. She ran quickly out into the street. Appearing right when the main force was absent. Are they aiming for this? No, I must stop them at all costs. As she ran, she thought of a way to deal with it. A man in a black hooded jacket knocked out the internal patrolman and said. Sorry to get you involved in this. Just think about getting some sleep. The patrol area isn't too far from here. So I can get there quickly. Chiyo Nuri thought as she hurried over there. Who the hell is this guy? I have to see his face. Lee Kyung looked forward, expecting something. A figure was running straight down the road. Every step is very urgent. Let's move on, shall we? Lee Kyung said. Stop. Chiyo Nuri shouted. She held the gun and pointed it at Lee Kyung and said. If you move again, I will shoot. You better not think about anything else. Lee Kyung thought to herself. Is this voice Nuri? Chiyo Nuri gasped and questioned. Who are you? A zombie sent by Turret. Lee Kyung turned away. Chiyo Nuri was surprised. She angrily shot towards Lee Kyung and shouted loudly. I told you not to move. Lee Kyung quickly dodged the bullet. Where do you want to run? Chiyo Nuri was angry. Three bullets were flying towards Lee Kyung. Lee Kyung suddenly jumped up. The bullets hit the wall. Lee Kyung walked step by step up the wall of the building, surprising Chiyo Nuri. He even climbed up the entire building. What kind of ability is that? Chiyo Nuri knelt down on one knee. Reached out to touch her shoe. Said firmly. There was no other way. This was the only thing left. There is a button on the side of the shoe. She pressed the button. It lit up. High-speed travel device with maximum radius. Co-1. She said. The shoe was suddenly covered in a ring of blue light. She remembered Jun giving this to her and saying. 
Koan is a moving device powered by orchids. It was created based on the blueprints kept in that government's branch 2 laboratory. An illustration of how it works appeared. June continued. Koan works by absorbing and releasing the energy generated by orchids. Like releasing movement and absorbing obstacles. That kind of thing. Back to the present. Shion Nuri was starting it up and speaking. Although this device is still in the testing phase. But it has to be usable before it can be distributed, right? But is it supposed to shake like this? Suddenly the shoe emitted white smoke. Shion Nuri was surprised. A burst of power from her shoes propelled her into the air. It left her floating. Shion Nuri remembered what Jun had said. That's right. There was something she needed to remember. Kowan was still in the early stages of testing. So it can't control its power. Jun said and raised her thumb. Smiling awkwardly. Shion Nuri was floating in the air now. She was panicking. Can't control her power. It's even more terrifying. She gritted her teeth and steeled herself. She thought. Landing. Just land steadily and it'll be fine. Shion Nuri dived down. Rolling a few times, she landed face down on the ground. Lee Kyung suddenly turned back and thought. What is this? Lee Kyung was shocked when she realized it was Chiyo Nuri. She ran really fast, thinking in confusion. How could he keep up with me? Chiyo Nuri looked up. Helplessly she shouted. That guy. Chiyo Nuri picked up the radio. Speak loudly. Internal patrol. Inform anyone with combat ability. Follow me to capture the intruder. Patrol 2. Got it. Patrol 3. Got it. The other end of the line picked up. Chion Nuri continued to chase Lee Kyung. She gritted her teeth and thought to herself. You can't escape. Chion Nuri ran after Lee Kyung. The patrol team members also appeared and chased after her. Lee Kyung was surprised. Lee Kyung was surrounded by Chion Nuri and the patrol officers. Chion Nuri pointed her gun and said. Now there's no way to escape. Chion Nuri ordered. Don't move. Or you'll get shot. Lee Kyung remained silent. Lee Kyung's eyes looked behind. Shio Nuri was surprised. Ha! Huh? Somewhere. Dongo called excitedly. Hey there. Let's go. One of the patrolmen turned back and asked. Dongo. Going together? Dongo happily replied. The commander said I could work together with everyone from now on. Myri turned back wondering. Sangul. Dongo yelled angrily. I said Dongo. That Dongo. I just said my name. I checked. The flower collection area is just ahead. Everyone get ready. The patrol officer spoke. Dongo was excited. Understood. Let's go. What are you waiting for? The whole team rushed forward. The team landed behind the mutant zombies. They were surprised. What was that? Special forces. One of the staff laughed. They found us. Let's go Myri. He replied coldly. Um. Myri suddenly transformed into a demon with bloodshot eyes. Showing off her strength, the zombies fell. They panicked. What was that? The body was too heavy. Dongo looked and sweated, thinking. That's not murderous intent. My body feels heavy too. It's scary but comfortable at the same time. Attack now. Everyone charged forward. Dongo also charged forward and punched a mutant zombie. Excitedly said. You bastards. Die. I am Lee Dongo with a strong body. The mutant zombie collapsed. The patrolman scoffed with amusement. They were weak. That was true. We'll catch them all at this rate. One of them replied. Suddenly a huge leg attacked a patrolman directly in the face. What's going on? Someone shouted. Myri was holding another guy by the head. Surprised, she turned around. A giant mutant zombie with bloodshot eyes appeared. The one following behind said happily. You guys are arrogant. You have real power. But how can you deal with our elite troops? Elite troops. I've seen it for the first time. The patrol officer was surprised. The giant mutant zombie opened its huge, drooling mouth. It looked like it was hungry for humans. The mutant zombie behind jumped onto the back of the giant mutant zombie. It turned around and threw out sharp daggers. Patrol officers were stabbed by flying knives. Dongo was also startled when he saw the knives flying towards him. He screamed. The mutant zombie on his back shouted excitedly. You dogs die. The giant monster also shouted. Myri charged straight towards the monster. A kick sent him flying. The monster slid down. Creating a huge commotion. The mutant zombie said angrily. Damn it, it's that brat. Can't die here. The mutant zombie was also affected by the fall. His forehead was swollen. He shouted arrogantly. You only kick me once and you dare ignore me. Even if you were there, you wouldn't dream of fighting on equal footing with the elite. 
Suddenly Brains appeared in front of the mutant zombie. He was surprised. What is this pile? Brains. Myri's second law. Myri began to use her internal energy. Blood gushed out. Myri screamed and punched the ground. At this moment, the brains appeared and surrounded the giant monster and the mutant zombie. The mutant zombie panicked. This. What is this? There was a big explosion. Dongo stood there, shocked. He thought to himself. Damn it. Myri hit the whole group at once. Myri turned to ask an injured employee. Are you okay? He replied. Yes, it's okay. Let's go back first. Everyone is injured. Planning to attack and then run away? A voice rang out. Myri turned around in surprise. A cloaked man saved the mutant zombie and the monster from Myri's attack. The mutant zombie was surprised. Sir Awa. Myri thought to herself. Who is it? The cloaked man suddenly advanced towards Myri. He raised his sword and said. The matter between us is not yet settled. He swung his sword down to slash at Myri. But she dodged it. Myri threw a punch. Punched the guy straight in the face. He got hit and said, right? Myri, Awa said with cold eyes. Myri looked at her. He was so surprised that he called out, Mom. The amount of hair. The amount of breath taken before speaking. I still absent-mindedly recall them after my mother's death. So I know. Awa stood thoughtfully in front of Myri. Myri was almost speechless at this moment. It was Mom. Myri and Awa stood motionless, looking straight at each other. Dongo sat next to a staff member who was losing a lot of blood from his injuries. He thought to himself. What did Myri just say about her mother? I heard her mother died. But now what? The clouds in the sky kept drifting. No one said a word to each other. This moment. It's not that I didn't want to talk. But I didn't expect it to come so quickly. Myri thought as she looked at Awa. Her face was expressionless. What should I say? No, what should I say? Myri thought anxiously. He seemed to helplessly lower his head. Me. Sweat poured down his face. He asked tremblingly. Why? He looked up with a pale face. Why? Mom was here. Awa closed her eyes silently. She reached out to Myri. Myri's eyes filled with tears. She said weakly. Mom. Turning the wheel of Dharma. She passed the exam to turn the academic. Gossip. Myri was torn apart by her force and sent flying. Myri was stunned. Myri. Dongo screamed. Myri really couldn't believe what was happening before his eyes. Pieces of his body flew off, sliding across the ground. Dongo shouted worriedly. Are you okay? Myri slowly reconnected his body. He knelt on the ground tremblingly and said. It was the technique Turret used. Why? Why did Mother use that? Awa ignored Myri. She turned to the mutant zombie. Let's go back. The zombie replied. Yes. I understand. Awa and the two turned and walked away. Myri on this side tried to scream. Wait. Mom, don't go. He asked in panic. Where did mom go? Why didn't she say anything? Mother. Myri kept calling Awa. She also stopped. Myri gritted her teeth. It was fine if she didn't say anything else, but. At least mom couldn't say it. Even if she died, would she still miss me? Myri looked at her back helplessly and said. Mom. It's me. I'm here. It's your Myri. Myri sobbed. Tears streamed down his face. Awa pulled the hood of her cloak back. She said. Always standing before my grave and always saying that you died for me. And yet you are still alive. She turned back. Her face still had no emotion. She said. Myri. What are you doing here? What? He was stunned. Then she and the two disappeared. Myri screamed in vain. Mom. Dongo tried to calm him down. Myri. Calm down. Dongo said. I don't know what happened but let's go back first. We've dealt with the zombies. The mission is complete and there are many injured. That person. Your mother. Before it gets dark. Let's go back and discuss this with everyone. Dongo hesitantly pulled Myri's hand to stand up. Everyone is still waiting for us, Myri. Dongo encouraged Myri. But at this moment, Myri's eyes had turned red. His face was emitting a lot of murderous intent. Now. Back when Lee Kyung was surrounded by Chion Nuri and the patrol group. Chion Nuri said defiantly. Now there's no way to escape. Don't move. Or you'll get shot. Chio Nuri ordered. Lee Kyung remained silent. Lee Kyung's eyes slowly turned back. Chio Nuri was surprised. Ha! Huh? Suddenly Lee Kyung disappeared to the surprise of the patrol officer. Disappeared. At this moment, Chio Nuri fell silent. But then she gritted her teeth and turned the gun up towards the sky. 
Lee Kyung was running on the floors of the building. Up there. Up there. Everyone said in amazement. Chiyon Nuri kept her finger on the trigger. She seemed very confused and panicked. Chiyon Nuri closed her eyes. But Chiyon Nuri finally put down his gun. The patrol asked worriedly. Damn it. I missed it. Commander. What should we do now? Chiyon Nuri replied. It's okay. Everyone go back. They were surprised. What? But the intruder still. Chiyon Nuri still turned to face that direction and said. It's okay. I'll handle it myself. The sky was getting dark. Chiyon Nuri sat in her office. She thought. The sun has already set. Why is Team 1 so late? Are they in a place where they can't get a radio signal? Just try calling for now. She thought and looked through the glass on the table. She was surprised. Someone's hand was holding the window. Chiyon Nuri asked sternly. What are you doing? It's quite noisy to sneak in. Lee Kyung was sitting on the windowsill. Startled. If you're going in, then hurry up and go in. It's cold outside. Chiyon Nuri said. Lee Kyung was surprised. How did he know? Do you have eyes in the back of your head? Lee Kyung walked in. He stood in front of Chiyon Nuri and handed her a piece of paper. Chiyon Nuri asked curiously. What is this? The content on Lee Kyung's paper was, Myri, where are you? Chiyon Nuri questioned. Suddenly saying those words. Don't you know what negotiation is? Lee Kyung was surprised. Chiyon Nuri stood up and continued. Answer my question first. Then I will provide the information later. Okay? Chiyon Nuri asked. Lee Kyung could only nod in agreement. Chiyon Nuri continued. Good. Question 1. Chiyon Nuri pointed at Lee Kyung's paper and asked. Did she write these words with her left hand? Oh, you're not answering? You don't want to negotiate? Or do you have to keep asking? Lee Kyung was quite confused. Chiyon Nuri immediately asked a series of questions. Who ordered her? Did she act alone? Was she threatened by someone? Was there a listening device? Were there patient clothes inside the gown? Lee Kyung was bewildered by Chiyon Nuri's series of questions. She thought to herself, what? What? What's wrong with her? Why did your hand become like that? Chiyon Nuri asked. Lee Kyung was surprised, but remained silent. Chiyon Nuri was losing patience. Still not going to answer? Okay, last sentence. Why? She came back this way. Chiyon Nuri asked, leaning her hands on the table. You pretended to be an intruder to lure me out, right? You wanted to follow me to find out where the office is? This way of returning is not like you at all. Chiyon Nuri said as she slammed her hand on the table. Chiyon Nuri kept banging her fists on the table faster and faster. She angrily said that if it were her, whether she walked, crawled on the ground, or flew here, she would still be welcomed with open arms by everyone. Why is that? She didn't even say a word to me. Why did she come back like this? Chiyon Nuri sobbed. Tears continuously fell from her eyes. This idiot, Chiyon Nuri scolded, while Lee Kyung remained silent. Lee Kyung finally spoke. When did she know? It's not easy to deceive your friend. As she spoke, she slowly took off her hood. Sorry for not telling you sooner. Nuri, Lee Kyung said with a smile, her neck had a mark that looked like it had been slashed. Chiyon Nuri quickly ran over and hugged Lee Kyung. She angrily said, I'll just let it go this time. Chiyon Nuri sobbed, because she had returned safely. Lee Kyung smiled, patted Chiyon Nuri comfortingly and replied, yes. Suddenly, Chiyon Nuri's attitude changed and she aggressively questioned Lee Kyung. Now, now, let's talk. Did Nuria save you? Why did she run off to find Myri as soon as she appeared? Lee Kyung suddenly replied, Nuri, just ask one question at a time, Lee Kyung thought to herself, her emotions changed so quickly. It's nothing, because of Senior Tarim's message, Lee Kyung explained, Chiyon Nuri was surprised. What? Found Senior Tarim? No, that's not it, Lee Kyung said. It was the message in my head. If it wasn't the message Naria left behind, it must have been engraved into the barracks emblem thanks to Senior Tarim's ability, Lee Kyung said as he looked at the badge in his hand. Chiyon Nuri said while looking at the badge, if it was Senior Tarim's ability, it was the ability to read the memory of an object and leave a mark on it. Lee Kyung also agreed. Yeah, but I don't know why this ability is activated now. Chiyon Nuri asked silently, but what does it have to do with Myri? Senior Tarim has never seen Myri. Lee Kyung was silent. Lee Kyung looked straight at the badge of a hand holding a red flame. The words left behind. I have seen the secret of this world. The beginning of everything is immortality. Nuri, Lee Kyung said. Chiyon Nuri's eyes were tense now. Lee Kyung continued. Is the outbreak of mutant zombies related to Myri? At this moment, the voice on the walkie-talkie on Chiyon Nuri's desk rang out. The captain and the commander were both surprised. Lee Kyung asked. What happened? Chiyon Nuri immediately replied. It was Dongo's voice. Has Team 1 returned? Something is wrong. I don't know what to do to stop him. 
Dongo said on the other end of the intercom. At this moment, both Chion Nuri and Lee Kyung were stunned. The walkie-talkie on the table continued to emit Dongo's voice. Now, Myri. Dongo called the headquarters in a panic. Something bad is happening. I don't know what to do to stop him. He continued. Now, Myri. A very strong stream of air is falling from the sky. The airstream fell to the ground, rocks flew out and exploded into a large hole in the ground. Everyone suddenly ran away from that stream of air. Everyone asked curiously. What's going on? Why so sudden? Did something fall from the sky? Let's go check it out. That murderous aura was Myri. His eyes were staring blankly ahead. Dongo then spoke again through the communicator. Myri had already charged into the heart of the enemy base. On the other end of the line, Shion Nuri asked in a panic. Myri raided alone? Why did she suddenly do that? Dongo stammered. That. He continued. Because Myri's mother had appeared. After hearing that, Lee Kyung and Shion Nuri were startled and speechless. Dongo tells the story. While fighting the zombies, Myri's mother suddenly appeared. She protected the zombies and disappeared together. It seems the zombies called Myri's mother Awa. He was talking to the other end of the line as he ran. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I thought he was going to find his mother. Otherwise, he wouldn't have done that. He carried two more people while running and talking. First, I'm on my way back to Changwon because someone got injured. The two people being carried by Dongo spoke up. Dongo is the best. But slow down for me. Dongo continued. I will tell you the details when I get back. Chiyo Nuri replied. Yes, I understand. After fainting and connecting with Dongo, Chiyo Nuri sighed and said. Myri's mother? What's going on? Chiyo Nuri continued. What to do? You heard it. Whether we like it or not, we have to run towards Myri. What will you do? You're not with us, right? Chiyo Nuri said to Lee Kyung. When Chiyo Nuri said that, Lee Kyung was startled and asked. How do you know? Chiyo Nuri turned back to look at Lee Kyung and replied. How would I know? If it was you, you would have been standing right in front of me. Why did you have to break the window and run away? You didn't want to come with us because you had other things to do. Right? When Xion Nuri finished speaking, Li Kyung was startled and thought to himself. It was so right that it made me break out in a cold sweat. What a terrifying perceptiveness. Li Kyung looked at the squad badge and said. There are still many doubts about Myri. I'm thinking that the leader of the Red Army could be Myri. She continued. It was easier to get information than to join the suicide squad. I wanted to go back to the squad more than anyone else. But it was too early. Sorry, but until then, everyone, Lee Kyung hadn't finished speaking when she saw Chiyo Nuri's hand reaching out and saying, Give it here, Lee Kyung asked curiously. The squad badge? Lee Kyung gave the badge to Chiyo Nuri and asked. It's fine to give it to her, but what does she need it for? Chiyo Nuri took the badge and replied. To mortgage. She continued. Isn't this important to you? Once you clear the suspicion and return to the squad, I will return it. If you want it back, you have to return in one piece. Got it? After hearing Chiyo Niri's words, Lee Kyung put on his hat and smiled in response. Got it. Thank you. Then she jumped out of the base and said. I will return safely. Nuri in the base said helplessly. All good promises. It was evening at the hospital. Dongo walked out of the hospital room and sighed. The injured person was brought back safely. Now let's go to the commander, shall we? Just then, Jun walked over with an exhausted look on her face and asked Dongo. Dongo, are you just coming back from a mission? Dongo turned to look at Jun and replied. Jun? Because a lot of things happened, and the commander will probably tell everyone soon. He asked Jun. But why is she in the research area at this hour? No, nothing. Jun looked lifeless from working 60 hours straight before staring at Dongo and asked. Nothing. Dongo replied. I mean her face was no different from a patient's. You asked again. That's right. Jun. That. I picked this up while fighting the zombies. Maybe I should give it to you. Then Jun looked at it and asked in surprise. This. What is this? And over at Myri's place. The monsters were playing tag. They were screaming to catch him. It was the ultimate squad. It was the zombies of Team 6 who were looking for food and saw Myri there so they chased after her. One of them said, be careful. He might be a superman. Another said, why bother? They continued, whether he was a superior or not, how the hell could someone like him win? Myri glanced at the zombies. One of them asked another zombie. So should we capture him and keep him as a prisoner or eat him? Suddenly, a zombie's head was blown off. It was very confused and surprised. And Myri jumped up and chopped off their heads. Gradually the other zombies were also destroyed. Then Myri landed on the ground. All the zombies' heads fell to the ground in front of Myri. He coldly squinted his eyes and stared straight ahead, saying, Mom, come out here. Then Myri jumped around. He jumped and exploded, killing all the zombies and harvesting teams 1 to 6.
After wiping out the zombie harvesting party, he stopped shouting. Fuck, come out. He finished speaking. Suddenly, several invisible red and black blades flew towards him. Pierced through him. Myri jumped back and said. Finally appeared. Herring suddenly appeared in front of Myri, preparing to attack and said, Of course, I'm not that mother of yours. He launched a slash at Myri so powerful that it caused the ground to shake. He squinted his eyes and smiled. Long time no see, are we acquaintances? No, am I the only one who thinks so? Myri was slashed, causing his body to stretch into small holes in the middle. He gritted his teeth and said angrily. Don't get in my way. Harang said in surprise. Oh my god, he really can't die. Myri used her ability to stretch her fingers and stab straight at Harang. But unexpectedly, Harang avoided his attack and even mocked him. On top of that, the attack was strange and disgusting. Harang continued, squinting. Show me an interesting move like this. Thanks. But you're the one in the way. We're just here to collect orchids. Look at the crushed flowers. Can you take responsibility? Herring said that and used his sword to cut off Myri's arm, sending it flying away and said. I heard you are not easy to defeat. Herring narrowed his eyes and smiled as if to say it was a challenge. Let's try it. Myri got really angry when she heard that. His eyes were bloodshot as he stared at Herring, who challenged him, saying, let me see how strong you are. Meanwhile in Jun's lab. She was checking something with a confused expression. How did it turn out like this? Is there a leak somewhere? She said with a worried look on her face as she stared at the screen. Why? It was clearly made based on the blueprint on this computer. Where did the error come from? She looked at the two pieces of equipment on the table with a puzzled expression. The zombie equipment that Dongo gave her. It seemed to be similar to Ko-1. Suddenly Naria appeared from behind and said. Isn't it natural that when Naria appeared, Jun was startled and screamed? She asked hesitantly, Naria, why are you suddenly here? Naria mentioned the zombie equipment problem that Jun was wondering about earlier. If she made it based on this blueprint, of course what she made would look like zombie equipment. Naria continued, because the blueprints are stored here, no. Both the research lab and the underwater city. All made by Turate. Naria's words made Jun very shocked and confused. Both the research lab and this underwater city, Naria looked at the screen and said. It's all made by Turate. Naria looked at the control panel that was displaying the messy neighborhood below and said. Turate has done a lot of research in this place. Naria added, Jun looked at her in surprise, let's say. Zombies that are similar in appearance to humans, their abilities will be shown based on their characteristics. Naria analyzed further. Wait, why did Turate create this place to conduct research? Jun asked, wondering. This was hard to believe, considering all the information was in this place. Well, I don't know. Naria replied. I'm not familiar with things like statuses, but it's certainly strange. Naria said calmly. What I mean is, how could Turate have researched a technique that was hundreds of years ahead of its time? Naria wondered the same thing. But this has nothing to do with me. I'm just passing by. With that, Naria waved at Jun and disappeared. Jun didn't have time to react and spread her arms out to stop Naria. Wait. Answer first and then leave. Naria. Jun stood up and shouted loudly, then fell to the ground herself. Nosebleed. She thought, gritting her teeth. It was too hard to believe. The information was here. It's information about humans. The bio-research screen is showing data. The zombie leader created this place to study humans. She wiped away the blood from her nose and continued thinking. Why? What was it all for? She pondered. I have to find out. She sat down at her desk and continued her research. Who knows? What if there's a hidden file that I don't know about? June thought optimistically. There is a secret about this world that I still don't know. She frowned and continuously typed on the keyboard to search for information. A pair of legs appeared. Almost there. Turate stood before something terrifyingly huge. Father, he had just called it father. Unbelievable. Those eyes were wide open looking at something. What is this? Lee Kyung wondered in confusion. She was standing in front of a colorful magical wall. It seems like I'm somewhere north. She guessed where she was. She looked around and said. This is the end. Not only that. She threw a rock at that wall to test it. The wall gradually erased that stone and then it disappeared without a trace. System error forced object deletion. The stone disappeared completely. Just by stepping through this wall, everything and everyone will be erased by it. Lee Kyung commented. I have never heard of such an ability. For a human, this ability has already surpassed the boundaries of life. She thought in confusion. She raised her head to look at the wall. And that was it. What was even stranger was. Why am I still here? It doesn't recognize me. She looked at the wall doubtfully. A wall this high probably surrounded not only Busan, but the entire world. Lee Kyung slowly reached out her hand towards the wall. No one knew about this wall. She thought. Up until now, I had only been going around the special area to explore the terrain for the battle plan. 
I had not even thought of leaving the southern area. She concentrated on her thoughts. As if it was pre-programmed, Lee Kyung frowned and reached out to touch the wall. Suddenly Lee Kyung realized something. She withdrew her hand. There was no use standing here thinking. She said helplessly. The origin of everything lies in immortality. She turned and walked away, adding. Let's go see Myri. She made up her mind and sped off. Dongo contacted Team 2 and 3 and told them to mobilize all their manpower. Shion Nuri told Dongo to get to work. The car sped down the road. Okay. Dongo replied. Oh, and where are we going? Dongo tilted his head and asked, confused. Honestly. Of course it's Busan. That's the zombie's lair. Shion Nuri said helplessly as she drove. I'm concentrating on driving, so you do it yourself. She yelled at Dongo. I'm not good at driving either. I don't know. You're this old and you still haven't got your license. What have you been doing all this time? She questioned him. If you had a license, I would have gone over the main points. What else would you get besides getting taller and stronger? Shion Nuri questioned Dongo. That. Sorry. He scratched his face and frowned. Thanks to Myri, all the zombie lairs in front of them had been destroyed. Although this was not part of the plan, it was not completely useless. Shion Nuri thought. With this momentum, she marched to Busan. She prepared to turn the wheel to accelerate. This was the golden moment to win. She affirmed. Heading straight to Busan. She screamed and accelerated the car. Dongo next to her was startled. Ha! Huh. Commander! Don't try too hard and get lost. Drive at 30 kilometers per hour. Dongo reminded. Something is moving very fast. Myri was fighting with Herring. Myri used the bone to hit Herring. He quickly blocked it. Myri swung the bone, causing the rocks around Herring to shatter. Suddenly I felt curious about something. According to the usual ritual, if the head is cut off, the creature will die, right? He jokingly asked Myri. With that, Herring used his sword to knock Myri's bone away. Myri was suddenly left weaponless. You probably do too. After saying that, Herring slashed Myri's neck, causing his head to separate from hers. If I cut off your head, you'll die right away. He said with hatred. Myri's hand immediately grabbed her own severed head. He threw the head straight at Herring. He dodged it and said, oh my gosh. He raised his hand to his forehead and laughed mockingly at him. Humans really don't understand common knowledge. Wait. Where did your head grow back? He asked, pointing at him. Myri appeared behind him. His eyes were filled with anger. Herring was still laughing happily. So it grew back in the same place. He said. Myri was furious. She yelled at the guy. Where is mom? Answer me. Calm down. Herring scratched his head and turned back to Myri. What should he do with this clingy brat? Myri's law, first form Bloodwind. He didn't say much. He launched a powerful attack on Herring with the Bloodwind move. The surrounding rocks and soil kept collapsing. Herring couldn't dodge. He took Myri's attack. He's really not ordinary. He said. I was just joking but my body is already burning up. He thought to himself. He didn't look injured. His fingers created a source of power, preparing to strike back. Wait. Should I get serious? Herring thought hesitantly. Go back Herring. It's about to start. A signal has been sent to Herring. Force him to retreat and return. It's already that time. I was going to fight you straight away but... He looked up at Myri regretfully and said. Myri didn't want to let it go. He flew up and raised his fist and shouted. Speak quickly. You're a clingy brat. You must be very sad, right? Herring continued to provoke Myri. Don't be so sad. After saying that, Herang gradually disappeared before Myri's eyes. We'll see each other again soon. Myri landed on the ground, confused. Not understanding anything. Where did he go? He looked around. Why did he suddenly disappear? He wondered. A sudden beam of light appeared. Myri had to dodge. He slowly opened his eyes to see what was going on. An honorable death. Will save us from the cursed twilight. It's Turret. It's those legs that just appeared. Not long now. Turret stood before the giant statue and affirmed. The new world will be opened. The sky was dark and gray. What was going on? Why did it suddenly light up? Someone wondered. Commander, what is that? Dongo said in panic. What? She replied. Chion Nuri looked up at the sky with a stunned expression. Not understanding anything. She opened her eyes wide and stammered. What the hell? Red spots and white trees stretched out across the sky. What is that? Shion Nuri exclaimed in surprise. Red spots and white trees spread densely across the sky. Shion Nuri looked up at the sky in panic. What was that? She opened her eyes wide in surprise. A tree. She wondered. 
Those strange things were growing across the sky of the city. Everyone started to turn their eyes to that strange thing. That thing. That side was the direction of Lord Turret. Was he attacking humans? They kept wondering. That thing, over there is Lord Turret's direction, is he attacking humans, the students kept wondering. Suddenly it pierced straight through the guard, leaving him no time to react. He cried out in pain. That strange tail was still moving. The guard's face began to swell as if wax had burst. Blood began to flow. He stammered and screamed. There was a loud explosion. The tail hit the guard and the guard exploded creating something large and slimy. It breaks into small clumps that cling to the ground. It looks very dangerous. Heading to Busan. At this moment, Chion Nuri and Dango looked up at the sky in confusion. He said in surprise. Horrible. What's that? The tree is talking, Commander. You, me, and the forgotten souls. Chion Nuri looked at the tree in the sky with a shocked face and said. This war is an opportunity for those who yearn for a new world. So this time, don't let me down. Terate's face was thoughtful. Going to Busan. That way of talking sounds like Terate. Dongo reasoned. Chion Nuri was still absent-mindedly standing by the car window, not saying anything. Suddenly Chion Nuri ordered Dongo. Dongo got in the car. He answered in surprise. Are we going to Busan? What if it's a trap? Wait. What's this all of a sudden? It's not like a commander at all. Dongo shouted in her direction. Chion Nuri got into the car and was about to drive away. Dongo, he had never driven before so he didn't know. When the signal turns yellow, you have to accelerate. She answered him implicitly. But if there is a chance. Before the light turns red, you have to go straight. Chion Nuri pulled the car's gear lever as fast as she could and continued. Myri was going to Busan anyway. Everyone was running to Busan except for the small defense force. She said as she drove away at full speed. On this side, Myri also noticed the tree in the sky. He looked and thought. What is that? A white tree? He didn't know. Suddenly, a pressure was placed on him, making Myri unable to stand. He cried out. He was pressed down on the ground, his body, Myri wondered in confusion. Suddenly, dozens of purple wires were working inside him. His cells were destroying him. He held his stomach and coughed. It rose in his throat. His cheeks puffed out. He pursed his lips. He couldn't stop it from coming out. Myri threw up something disgusting. Myri gasped after vomiting. Before him was a mess of intestines. He couldn't tell what it was. Why is my body suddenly? Suddenly his arm ripped itself away from his body. He cried out in surprise. His body was slammed onto the ground. He cried out in pain. He didn't stop. His legs started to separate from his body. He couldn't control his body right now. He was dizzy. He stuttered. Suddenly his eyes fell out like his leg just now. He opened his mouth to gasp. His eyes were empty. Blood was pouring out. It hurt. He opened his mouth and screamed in pain. He was dizzy. He was being crushed by something. You said you would die for me. A woman said with a smile. Ha. Huh? Myri asked. You said you would die for me. The woman was slowly being eaten away by something and disappeared. Mother. Myri called the woman back. I said. The woman turned into a mess. Die for me. Those slimy things covered Myri's face. Faces appeared. Floated around him. Talking. You said you would die for me. You said you would die for me. The face gradually melted away. Divided into dozens of small faces, they spoke simultaneously into Myri's eyes. You said you would die for me. It tortured him mentally. His mind was now manipulated. The image of the woman with the words. You said you would die for me. It kept appearing more and more clearly in his mind. His mind was filled with the image of the headless woman and dozens of identical sentences. Myri. What's wrong? The woman with her eyes and mouth covered in a monstrosity said. Here again. At this moment, Myri's empty eyes were sinking deep into darkness. He was vaguely unable to escape. Cold. You feel it. His face was blank. Mom. Mom. His face slowly faded into the darkness as he called out. Heyong. Over here. Someone called Heyong's name. Ah. Uh, where? She asked. Heyong quickly injected the drug into that bare head with empty eyes. Is it okay to stab like that? Jizian asked worriedly. Heyong with a pale face. Worriedly replied. It's probably okay. Myri. Myri him. Aren't we too late? Heyong turned to Jizian with tears in her eyes and said. Will he be okay? She couldn't help but worry. Jizian frowned doubtfully and thought to herself. It's okay. It'll be okay. Jizian reassured herself and Heyong. He'll be fine. Jizian hugged Myri's head and said worriedly. Don't worry. Heyong looked at Myri crying loudly. Myri, we miss you so much. 
Jizian said sadly to Myri who was in his arms. The sky is still dark gray. Is it because of the medicine? Jizian said while holding Myri and running in panic. Heyong ran in front and replied with a frown. Yes. You know Myri got the injection, too. She remembered the scene where she gave him the injection earlier. I think the medicine doesn't work because it's experimental. Heyong said. After Myri left, I retested the remaining cells and found that the drug was destroying Myri's cells. Heyong frowned at the things in the test tube. She was confused. The drug was working. So can we give him another medicine to replace it? Jizian suddenly asked. Yes. He should be back to normal soon. Heyong said lazily. I am. Doing the right thing. Right, auntie? Jizian looked at her in surprise when she heard that. Because she was afraid that he would die, she followed the sound of the explosion. Heyong stopped and cried loudly. The truth is, he was about to die just like she wished. She said painfully. But you saved his life. You're not selfish, right? Jizian sweat dropped as he listened and said nothing more. Myri doesn't want to say goodbye to US, does she? Jizian said. You think so? Heyong wiped her tears, and they continued running forward. So let's go to the second team's camp and meet Kyuho. Jizian hugged Myri's head and ran away quickly. Yes. She replied. So warm. In Jizian Myri's arms he felt that warmth he thought. No there was a walkie-talkie in Heyong's backpack that she had left with Myri. It was emitting a voice. Don't come here. It was warning. Don't go to the second team camp, Heyong. It warned Heyong not to go to the second team camp. But she couldn't receive this message. Heyong and Jizian were both stunned by something. They gaped and looked to one side. Auntie, everyone. Heyong shouted in panic. Before them was a battlefield. The people from the second team were massacred. They were lying dead on the ground. Blood was everywhere. What happened? She screamed. Heyong used the walkie-talkie to talk to Kyuho. Jizian reminded Heyong. She looked back and realized she had left it there. I left my bag there. She said. What? Jizian asked. Heyong. Jizian. This way. Kyuho suddenly appeared at the door. Opening the door, he called out their names. Kyuho. What's going on? Jizian asked in surprise. They quickly ran towards where Kyuho was standing. I'll explain later. Hurry up and hide here. Kyuho reminded them. So this is it? Awa suddenly appeared behind Kyuho. Kyuho turned around in surprise to look at her. Kyuho. Who is that? Jizian stuttered. Damn it. Run. Quickly. Kyuho anxiously urged the two of them to run. Myri lay in Jizian's arms, calling out dreamily. Mom. There's no time. Kyuho shouted in panic. Space seemed to slow down. Kyuho. Someone called out Kyuho's name. Kyuho behind him fell backwards. Jizian also lost her balance. They couldn't stand. Auntie. Heyong called out to Jizian in panic. The surroundings in everyone's eyes seemed to be spinning. There is some kind of pressure going on around them. What is it? Suddenly Jizian's head fell to the ground. His face showed panic. Myri also woke up after leaving Jizian's embrace. One of his eyes had recovered. He looked at what was happening in panic. At Awa's feet were Kyuho and Jizian's bloody heads. Myri's head lay next to them. Still conscious, she looked at them. The girl suddenly screamed and got up. What's going on? Why am I here? I clearly got my head cut off. Could it be that everything was a dream? The girl gasped, her eyes wide open. If it wasn't a dream, then she was affected by some unknown power. This is no time to sit around thinking about this. She ran off. I have to confirm. Jizian's eyes widened. Myri looked at her aunt helplessly. The sight of the heads of his two loved ones lying motionless on the ground made him freeze. Myri was silent, not knowing what expression to make. He let out a ha sound. It was Jizian complaining to him. Memories of a gentle smiling aunt. Or the way she held him. Little by little it came flooding back. Miss, stop joking around. Get up. Myri was shocked by the scene. His eyes were drooping, lifeless and full of pain. Myri had not finished speaking when a spear pierced her head. Just in time, Myri. Come with me. She walked away with that spear. There are still many people up there. The two heads were still there. It showed that they were dead. Why? Why did you do that, mom? She was a little surprised by the question. He was so angry that he shouted. They were all good people. They weren't bad people. His mother opened her lips to speak but stopped. She pulled his head out of the spear and said, Have you forgotten? Myri, when you were little you always ran to find me. You wouldn't even go to the bathroom without me. She lifted his head. Gazed at his desperate head. She continued to speak. Or when she went to sleep, she insisted on holding her mother's hand. Tarek's plan was a war between humans and zombies. To be honest, mom was very concerned about that. 
She hugged him to her chest. Then put a kiss on your forehead. Mom will kill everyone around you. You will only be able to look at mom forever. Dear Myrie, let's go. She grabbed his hair. As for him, his face was already covered in tears. He clenched his teeth. Unable to hold back his tears, he sobbed. Myrie started to cry. He couldn't fight his sadness anymore. He cried because his mother's arms were too cold. Or because his mother had changed. If not, then your tears fall because of the death of those you cherish. Myrie no longer knows who the sadness inside her is for. The mother suddenly realized that he had escaped her grasp. It turned out that this girl saved Myrie. She said, you. The girl gasped, her face filled with fear. I clearly killed it. How is it still alive? Another transcendent? The girl ran away. No need to chase. Kill all the humans and take Myrie away. Deep in the forest, the little girl realized it was all real. It's not a dream, it's not a power. It's all real. Everyone is dead. Both Jizian and Dr. Kuho. Me, Myrie spoke. The little girl replied. Myrie. I looked at him in panic. I stammered. What should Myrie do? She killed Miss Jizian and Dr. Kuho. If this goes on we'll all die. Kill her, please. Kill, she wants me to kill. Mom? Impossible. He answered helplessly. The girl asked in surprise. Impossible? Why not? Miss Jizian tried to save you. I shouted. Wasn't she dead because of her? He thought. Miss Jizian. He remembered that terrible scene. And then burst into tears. In your eyes, she's nothing. So it's okay to let her die. Is that what you mean? The girl collapsed in front of the situation. And he could only stammer. Oh well. Hateful. The important people are all dead, everyone is shaking in fear. I don't want to see anymore. Please, Myrie. Help me. I beg you. At this point, what the hell are you still hesitating about? What is important to me? Myrie, the call came out vague and indistinct. The memories came back. He gritted his teeth. The tears wouldn't stop. He shouted so loudly that the little girl jumped. He stood up. Myrie, you go. Then he left. Leaving the little girl crying. He returned to that place. The place where so many people died. Myrie called out, Mom. Stop it. Myrie heard her mother's words. What's wrong? She pushed him. Made him fall to the ground. Why are you shaking like that? If you don't stop. Child. She continued laughing. How about you? Are you trying to kill me again? He was startled and scared. That's it, son. Run Myrie. Miss Jizian said loudly. Myrie is dangerous. Run away. Myrie now child. He looked at his aunt with wide eyes. Thinking. How could she? Jizian spoke. Dangerous. Before he could finish his sentence, his mother chopped his head in half. Myrie's mother swung. The head flew far away. Half of her head was still trying to protect him. Myrie ran. No need to fight. What happened before his eyes made him stunned for a moment? Is she the one holding Myrie's head? Perhaps while holding your head, she was able to regenerate little by little thanks to your blood. How arrogant, acting like your mother. She looked at Jizian and said disdainfully. Then she turned to look at him and continued. Myrie, mother. He sat on the ground, bowed his head and growled, saying he had already told her to stop. 